eh, per l'appunto dell'iniziativa Laboratori dal Basso, togliamo questi minuti ancora di, diciamo, di setup della videoconferenza per eh, brevemente spiegarvi un po' eh, cos'è Laboratori dal Basso per chi di voi non, la, non conoscesse ancora l'iniziativa. Um, Laboratorio dal Basso è uno strumento uh, pensato per le giovani realtà pugliesi, quindi per le giovani start up o associazioni pugliesi, per dar loro supporto uh, per meglio fare uh, quello che già fanno, quindi per meglio fare impresa. Il supporto che è stato pensato per le giovani realtà pugliesi è stato il supporto in termini di know-how, di conoscenza, piuttosto che di uh, un supporto di tipo economico finanziario. L'idea di Laboratori dal Basso è che le, eh, le giovani, eh, giovani start-up, le giovani associazioni pugliesi possano ideare, progettare sulla base, di, sulla base dei propri bisogni di apprendimento un vero e proprio percorso di formazione basato per l'appunto sui propri bisogni per approfondire le tematiche di proprio interesse e quindi per meglio fare quello che già stanno facendo, quindi per meglio fare impresa, quindi un apprendimento finalizzato all'imprendere, all'imprenditoria. L'idea è che più realtà si mettano insieme e formino un cluster e insieme progettino questi corsi di apprendimento, quindi ai proponenti, quindi ai ragazzi, alle giovani realtà pugliesi è richiesto di identificare le tematiche identificare i docenti e identificare anche le modalità formative quindi è totalmente in mano la palla è totalmente in mano ai proponenti che creano sulla base dei propri bisogni percorsi di apprendimento laboratori dal basso si divide principalmente in tre azioni laboratori per l'appunto testimonianze e mentoring laboratori e testimonianze e testimonianze diciamo è un po quello che noi chiamiamo il cicchetto di laboratori quindi è l'invitare sul territorio relatori eh, diciamo eccellenti nel campo dell'imprenditoria e dell'innovazione che vengono per l'appunto qui in Puglia a raccontare il proprio percorso eh, di successo, quindi un'azione di sensibilizzazione nei confronti della, diciamo, dei giovani pugliesi, delle giovani realtà pugliesi, di come eh, gente che ce l'ha fatta, eh, per l'appunto come ha, ha fatto per la, a, diciamo, a realizzare la propria il proprio successo, la propria impresa, ecco, la propria idea di impresa, quindi portarli qui sul territorio a raccontare la propria esperienza. Laboratori ve li ho descritti, l'ultima iniziativa è mentoring, quindi un percorso di affiancamento di un mentor, quindi una persona senior che ha già esperienza, affiancarla invece alle giovani realtà, quindi associazioni o eh, microimprese che sono in uno stadio primordiale, quindi in una fase di start up, quindi eh, beneficiare della, pre, della, della conoscenza, del know-how, delle reti di relazione dei, eh, di persone senior, di chi ha già fatto un percorso di successo, a beneficio per l'appunto delle giovani realtà, eh, che sono in una fase eh, che muovono i primi passi. Eh. C'è da dire che l'iniziativa laboratori, così come quella di testimonianze, eh, si sono concluse il 30 di giugno, quindi adesso eh, stiamo procedendo con la valutazione, con l'approvazione e con l'esecuzione di tutti i laboratori approvati. Ci saranno eh, più laboratori, circa una sessantina di laboratori su varie tematiche, da adesso alcuni sono già in corso fino al 30 di novembre, termine ultimo entro cui dovranno terminare per l'appunto tutte le attività dei vari laboratori. Mentre è ancora attiva, eh, anche se diciamo, non è pienamente partita, l'iniziativa di mentoring, quindi se qualcuno eh, fosse intenzionato per l'appunto ad applicare all'iniziativa mentoring, diciamo, è un'iniziativa ancora aperta, lo sarà ancora per, per, per qualche mese. Niente, questo è tutto, io volevo ringraziare innanzitutto i ragazzi di Question Club per aver organizzato questo corso, ringraziare voi per essere presenti qui e niente, vi auguro un buon corso, una buona lezione. Grazie. Grazie Domenico. Allora io volevo, volevo che noi ci presentassimo brevemente come Question Cube e anche per diciamo, riempire il tempo fin quando riusciamo a, a contattare John Boss che è il nostro primo relatore. Allora, eh, noi siamo una startup, siamo nati nel 2011, eh, facciamo, lavoriamo nell'ambito dei motori di ricerca, in particolare facciamo question answering, ovvero dei motori di ricerca eh, a cui si possono fare delle domande in linguaggio naturale che rispondono con delle risposte che sono dei pezzettini di testo e non quindi dei documenti interi, come un classico motore di ricerca. 
e in particolare lavoriamo con tecnologie di tipo semantico. È per questo motivo che insomma, vogliamo eh, approfondire quanto più possibile questo ambito e eh, condividere con tutti i presenti in particolare eh, quella che eh, la conoscenza che i, i, i relatori che abbiamo selezionato eh, possono portare eh, sia a noi sia insomma, a tutta la comunità di start-up per pugliesi ma anche eh, chiunque altro potesse essere interessato. Um, le giornate saranno quattro e si struttureranno eh, in una lezione mattutina e una lezione pomeridiana. Eh, quella mattutina sono dalle 9 e mezza alle 12 e mezza e quella pomeridiana tendenzialmente dalle 14.30 alle 17.30. Eh, L'unica eccezione è quella di Massimiliano Ceramita che eh, interverrà soltanto per un'ora eh, nella giornata di domani. Eh, tendenzialmente ehm, cioè, le prime tre giornate si svolgeranno in quest'aula mentre la quarta giornata si svolgerà, ehm, do oggi dovremo avere la conferma definitiva, però dovrebbe svolgersi in un'aula al Dipartimento di Lingue, però ehm, se seguite la pagina Facebook oppure la pagina online del, del laboratorio troverete, eh, appena, appena abbiamo disponibile, l'indicazione su quale sarà l'aula che ci ospiterà il quarto giorno, quindi venerdì. Eh, che altro? Eh, volevo ringraziare eh, tutti quelli che ci hanno dato supporto in questa eh, nell'organizzazione del laboratorio, in particolare volevo ringraziare l'Adi perché ci ha permesso di ottenere quest'aula, eh, altrimenti probabilmente non ci saremmo riusciti. E, oltre a questo volevo ringraziare tutti eh, i, diciamo, i progetti partner istituzionali, la Regione Puglia, l'Arti, eh, Bollenti Spiriti per, per il supporto che ci, hanno, che ci hanno dato e la possibilità di organizzare un evento che altrimenti non saremmo mai eh, riusciti ad organizzare da noi. Ed inoltre, eh, Vorrei ringraziare chi ci ha dato supporto dal punto di vista anche diciamo, logistico, anche di diffusione dell'evento, ovvero i nostri amici di Splashwood, di Zenfid, di Nealogic, di Cincerus che hanno insomma, collaborato nel, nel fare in modo che la notizia circa il laboratorio si, si espandesse il più possibile. Ora, ehm, comunque io sono Piero, eh, lui è Pierpaolo, diciamo, siamo i due eh, siamo i deferenti per, per tutte le giornate per cui avrete a che fare con noi. Adesso Pierpaolo, non so, siamo pronti più o meno? Eh, dannazione voi lo sapete meglio di me perché state vedendo lo schermo immagino che quindi... va bene, allora scusate qualche minuto ancora appena, abbiamo, appena avremo completato la... appena saremo riusciti a, a, a far partire la videoconferenza con John Boss eh, introdurrò John Boss e poi cominceremo con la prima lezione Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, good morning. Please raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, welcome to this uh, lecture. This lecture is about uh, computational semantics. I will talk about uh, uh, inference, about models, about representation. In the second lecture, if we have time for that, uh, we'll talk about how to go from text to meaning representations. And in the third lecture, time permitted, I will talk about uh, a game of a purpose for semantic annotation for word drop. So this lecture will be about languages and about two different kinds of languages. Uh, la natural language, language spoken by humans, languages such as English, Dutch, Italian, German, and languages as sort of spoken by machines. And I, languages I mean are a logical language, sometimes uh, man, uh, named calculi, or programming languages. And these are artificial languages, or formal languages. And the idea of formal semantics is to provide a mapping from these ordinary human languages to uh, logic. And the aim of formal semantics, one of the objectives, is to predict inferences. Okay, that's the study of meaning. So what we want to do is to map human language, which is ambiguous, to a logical language, which is unambiguous. Okay, but what are logical languages or calculi? Well, there are many different kind of logics on the market, and they differ, uh, first of all, with their expressive power. Yeah? So on the one side you've got propositional logic with very limited expressive power 
and on the other side you've got higher order logic with a lot of expressive power. And in between those extremes you've got lots of different kind of families of logic. Okay, description logics, modal logic, first order logic, second order logic, and so on and so on. And since we want to work with a logical language, it's very important to pick a appropriate language. And you might say, okay, why don't we just pick the most expressive language? Well, there's a drawback, because the more expressive your language is, the less efficient it is for performing inferences. Inference, so what is inference then? Well, if you look in a dictionary or in a handbook, you will find this kind of definition. Inference is making explicit what is implicit. Or, often you see, inference is drawing conclusions from premises. Or, gaining knowledge through reasoning. Okay? Those are often definitions for inference. From a bird's eye's view, there are three types of inference. Abductive reasoning, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. And I will show you uh, by examples what the differences are between these three types of reasoning. First, I will introduce a game. I call this inference game. Inference games. And basically you get a set of premises in natural language and a conclusion in natural language. And the game is to decide whether we can derive the conclusions given the premises. For example, a premise could be every boy smiles, Mia is a woman, and the conclusion could be Mia smiles. And the idea is that, you know, is that a good conclusion or not? And does it, is it derived from the premises or not? Yeah. If you see a thing like these premises and then a horizontal line and a conclusion, you can read them in a way as an if-then statement. Yeah. If every boy smiled, and Mia as a woman, then Mia smiled. Is that true or not? It's a game, so every game has rules, and the, ra and the rules of these games is that the references, for example, proper names, and the context, they normally stay constant, right? So if you talk about a person called Mia in the premises, and a person called Mia in the conclusion, you normally talk about the same person. Okay. So abductive reasoning, is often what is called guessing for an explanation, okay? So maybe we see that a dog is red, as you can see on this picture, yeah? uh, and we might try to find an explanation for that. Maybe it's raining outside, maybe it jumped in the pool, yeah? and that could be an inference that we make. But abductive reasoning, you sometimes make a mistake. For example, there could be a different reason why the dog is wet example as you can see in the picture here that's abductive reasoning the second kind of reasoning is inductive reasoning inductive reasoning is about making generalizations for example you observe many different kinds of dogs you say this dog has four legs that dog has four legs and that one and that one and this one and that one too and from that information from these premises you conclude that every dog has four legs Okay, that's called inductive reasoning. But again, there you can make mistakes because sometimes you see exceptions to the rules. Yeah? You see here a dog that has only three legs or a dog with many legs. Okay, and that's the disadvantage of inductive reasoning. In this talk, I'm interested in deductive reasoning. That is, drawing conclusions from a set of premises. Okay, this is also called logical reasoning. For example, if you have every dog jumped in the pool and another premise, Fido is a dog, you can conclude from that that Fido jumped in the pool. Okay. Given that we concentrate on deductive reasoning in this lecture, we can define two inference tasks. And we do that in this lecture with the help of first order logic. And these two different inference tasks are one, informative, informativeness checking, or sometimes called entailment checking. Or, and the second is consistency checking, or checking for contradictions. The first task, you basically check for new information, check if there's any new information given the premises. And the second task, you try to find a contradiction. 
And in this talk, in this lecture, I would like to show you why this is useful for natural language understanding. So we look again at these sentence gains, and uh, we start with single sentence gains. And for each of these examples, you need to judge whether the example sentence is consistent or inconsistent. Consistent will, s is mean, uh, will mean here true in at least one situation, uh, or inconsistent, that means it's false in every thinkable situation. At the same time, you want to see if that example sentence is informative. That means false in at least one situation, or in uninformative, true in every situation. Yeah. So here's the first example. This is uh, something that uh, George W. Bush said. He said, when there's more trade, there's more commerce. Yeah. And this is an example of a thing that is not informative. Yeah. This is thing is always true in every possible situation. Okay. So it's consistent, but not informative. No new information. Example two. Uh, this example is information chiefs in many countries sound alarm of revelations by Edward Snowden. Is this informative? Yes, there's a lot of new information there. Is it consistent? Yes, it's also consistent. It doesn't contradict with anything that we know. Here's an example from uh, Venice. Maybe you know it if you've been in Venice. And if you go from, from the station to uh, Piazza San Marco, you will see these signs. Yeah, you can, San Marco, you have to go to the left, or San Marco, you have to go to the right. Yeah, so basically it says turn simultaneously left and right to go to San Marco. Well, that's clearly inconsistent, right? Is it informative? Yeah, it's very informative, right? Because you've got so much information that you have a contradiction. And... Uh, so it's, it's, in, it's informative and not consistent. So, now we move to multi-sentence games. Okay, and uh, the idea is a bit different here. It's an extension of what we did before. So for each example, we have to judge whether a new contribution is consistent, again, or inconsistent. That means uh, with, our, with respect to the previous text. Or informative or uninformative with respect to the previous text. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. And here I use the horizontal line, right? So above the line we see the premises and uh, below the line the conclusion. So from the king had cornflakes for breakfast this morning, can we derive the king had cornflakes for breakfast? Yes. So is it informative? No. Is it consistent? Yes. Okay. Another example, the king had cornflakes for breakfast this morning. Does it, give the, does it give information that the queen had cornflakes for breakfast? No. So, it is very informative. Is it consistent? No, it's not consistent. Maybe they had breakfast together, the king and the queen, right? Here's another example. Bob and Sue are married. And then we have as, as conclusion, Bob and Sue are married to each other. Is that informative? Well, yes, because if Bob and Sue are married, it doesn't mean they're married to each other. And maybe Bob is married to Mary and Sue is married to John. Is it consistent? Yes, it is consistent. Bob is married to Sue and Sue is married to Bob. Is it informative? No. Normally, if Bob is married to Sue, then also Sue is married to, married to Bob. Is it consistent? Yes, it's consistent. Now we look at quantifiers. Words like every and a. Uh, and so on and no. So here we've got Jules eats a good Kahuna burger every day. Does that entail that Jules eats a Kahuna burger every Tuesday? Yes, so it's not informative. There's no new information in the, in the conclusion. Is it consistent? Yes, it's consistent. There's no contradiction. Jules eats a Kahuna burger every Tuesday. Does that entail that Jules eats a Kahuna burger every day? No, so it's very informative. There's a lot of new information in the conclusion. Is it consistent? Yes, it's consistent. More burgers. So Jules eats a kahuna burger every day. Does that entail that Jules eats a big kahuna burger every day? Uh, no, so it's very informative. Right? It's consistent. Yes, it's consistent. And now we turn it around. Jules eats a big kahuna, a big kahuna burger every day. Does it entail that Jules eats a kahuna burger every day? No, so that's... Very, uh, it does actually. Yes, so it's not informative. Is it consistent? Yes, it's also consistent. 
We can sum these up, these determiners, like every a uh, and no, and in the linguistic uh, literature and formal semantics, uh, you normally assign two different arguments to these determiners, like every a uh, and no, uh, and uh, depending on the uh, properties of these determiners, they are either uh, monot monotonic increasing or decreasing in the first and second arguments. Yeah? So if you look at every, you can see that every has a down arrow and up arrow, that means that if you, for example, the first argument like uh, a noun, a kind of argument like boy, from every boy runs, you can also infer that every small boy runs. Yeah? So if you make the set of the first argument smaller, uh, by restricting the set of boys to small boys, you still get the argument. But on the second argument, the verb phrase, uh, it's the other way around. So if you have every boy runs quickly, you can uh, it follows that every boy runs. Yeah. Even though running quickly is contained in the set of the running events. Yeah. You see that uh, it behaves different. So a small boy runs until that a boy runs, and a small small boy runs quickly uh, until that a small small boy runs. And for no, it goes both downwards. So no boy runs until that no small boy runs, and no boy runs until that no boy runs quickly. And of course, if you want to model this, you want to get these predictions right. So we go on with the examples. This is an example about uh, adjectives. So if you say Jerry is a large mouse, and every mouse is an animal, then you can uh, can you follow? Does it follow that Jerry is an animal? Uh, well, I think yes. So it is not informative and it's also consistent. But if you have Jerry is a large mouse, every mouse is an animal. Can you then infer that Jerry is a large animal? Then no, because a large mouse doesn't necessarily mean that it is an, a large animal. Yeah? So that's defi definitely informative, and it's also consistent. Okay. Uh, notice that not every adjective behaves like that. So if you have Jerry is a brown mouse, and every mouse is an animal, then you can also infer that Jerry is a brown animal. Yeah? So there are different kinds of adjectives, and you need to take care of that. Uh, here's another example. Marcellus is a clever person. Can you uh, derive from that Marcellus is clever? Yes, I think so. So it's not informative. But if you say Marcellus is a clever criminal, uh, does it entail that Marcellus is clever? I don't think so. That's kind of informative. So clever is another kind of adjective that sort of uh, it, its properties depend on what kind of thing it modifies. Yeah. So clever cr criminal doesn't mean that you're clever in general. Uh, Comparatives, okay. Bolt is faster than Powell. Uh, Powell is faster than Bolt. Is that informative? Yes, very informative. Is it consistent? No, it's not consistent, right? The knowledge that we have about being faster than someone else uh, excludes this possibility. Possibility. So here you've got an example of an inconsistent kind of text. Here's another one. Uh, you see a sign if no pets are allowed in this area and also a sign all pets must be on the leash in this area. Is it informative? Uh, yes, very informative because it's not consistent, right? It doesn't make sense if you say that no pets are allowed there, they also have to be on the leash. Another example, just to show you how complicated these things are if you look at natural language. So Steve visited Bologna and Pisa, does it, uh, from that does it follow that Steve visited Bologna? Yes, it does, right? But if you say uh, Steve visited Bologna and Pisa, does it follow that Steve visited only Bologna? No, it doesn't, right? Then you still, you surely have an inconsistency, okay? So a little word like only is very important if you want to uh, look at, at it, its meaning. Here's one of my favorite examples. Don't try this at home, okay? So we bought uh, fresh milk last week. And today we drink what we bought last week. So today we drink fresh milk, right? So that's very uh, a lot of new information, I think. So uh, the problem, of course, here is that freshness is really depending on the thing that it modifies. Okay, so it's, it's a time-sensitive uh, adjective, very hard to model. Uh, just to continue with this kind of examples, often you have also elliptical kind of things in texts things that refer back to something in a context. So we bought fresh milk last week, so did the neighbors. The neighbors, neighbors bought fresh milk last week. Yeah? That's, uh, that is uh, not informative, 
but uh, you know we have to look at this uh, little word uh, so what the meaning of that word so me is to find out what the meaning of the whole text is and the same you have with uh, certain kind of pronouns or anaphora so if you have Bill ordered a beer and John ordered one too and this little word one refers to something mentioned in the context before yeah? so John ordered a beer is following from that premise the set of premises okay so those were some examples uh, now uh, just to give you an idea what kind of things we're looking at what kind of problems we try to deal with uh, here's some uh, terminology to talk about these different kinds of uh, of, of possibilities uh, so I talked about inconsistent and consistent kind of things so uh, uh, and I also talked about uh, informative and non-informative and if you compare the linguistic with the logical kind of terminology you, you get this picture here so if you have in the middle here uh, contradictory that means it's true in no models uh, but what I mean by model I'll come back in a second but it's true in no possible situation as contradictory or sometimes called inconsistent uh, in, in logic uh, kind of literature then in linguistic they call something synthetic if it's true in some but not in all possible situations and they call something analytic if it's true in all models yeah so true in all models means of course that the tautology uh, if it's synthetic or analytic then it means it's consistent and if it's con contradictory or synthetic then it means it's informative yeah because there's so many different kinds of things uh, names that people use to describe these situations I put them here in a nice overview okay uh, also note that uh, you can sort of uh, use this concept of informativeness and uh, consistency to also explain what entailments and paraphrases are right so uh, and I'm again I'm showing this because you will find this often in the literature yeah, so entailment what does that mean okay text T entails a sentence S if uh, that S is not informative with respect to the text yeah I always say you know it doesn't contain any new information and yeah? that's why it's entailment and a paraphrase is a more is a special case of that thing so two sentences are paraphrases of each other if they entail each other right okay uh, you can also uh, uh, look at uh, the level between uh, uh, the difference between the, these relations on in the sentences and, and between words so if you have an entailment or a paraphrase or a contradiction you have those same relationships in a way between words uh, an entailment is actually an hyponymy in a way and a paraphrase is a synonymy between two words and a contradiction is an antonymy okay that's uh, also useful to know okay so in this kind of comparison I used uh, models yeah and what are models well the models that I'm interested in are those introduced by uh, Alfred Tarski, a Polish uh, logician and basically he introduced the whole idea of a model theoretical semantics and that's also the one that we use in the study of language but what kind of models do I really mean? well I mean these kinds of models these are pictures of, of, of uh, some women and some men but these are not real persons they are approximate uh, approximate people they are not they are really approximations of reality these are not real persons and these are exactly the kind of things that we want to study in semantics but we don't really st study uh, human beings we study more situations right uh, something like this yeah and it's not a real situation as you can see here. it's an approximation of reality and we use approximation because it's easier to work with okay and often we make it even simpler than it uh, than the example before um, so here you see a situation yeah and what we use we use this you know we say this is a model and a model is in a way an interpretation yeah so a model a model like the model you see here can satisfy a sentence yeah? or we can say a sentence s is true in a model m yeah or m satisfies s or m is m is an interpretation of s yeah, the sentence yeah. for example if you look at this little model here this model satisfies 
the statement, the sentence, that the dog is outside. Right? You see a dog here, it's clearly outside. But this model does not satisfy a bird sits on the car. No? There's a bird here, but it doesn't sit on the car, it's sitting on a house. Yeah? As you can imagine, it's still hard to work, to use a computer to work with these kinds of models. So we do another sort of approximation. We say, this model that we see here, the Lego kind of model, is, uh, is represented in the structure here on the, on, on the right hand side. Yeah? And basically it looks very complicated, it's very simple. You say, okay, we have got a model, it consists of two things, a set of entities called the domain, so D, yeah? and an interpretation function, F. The set of entities is just yeah, a set of uh, yeah, names for these entities. So I usually use D1, D2, and D3 to name these entities. And then we have the interpretation function that map maps certain symbols to things in the domain. Okay? For example, man is mapped to the set of objects called D1. A woman is mapped to a thing called D2. Yeah? So in this model there's only one man and only one woman. Yeah? We name this D1 and that's called D2. House is mapped to the set of entities D3 and D4. Yeah? There's one here and one there. Dog is mapped to D5. Yeah, one there. A bird is mapped to D6. A tree is mapped to D7 and so on and so on. We also have two place relations. Uh, oh no. Oh yeah, so for example, near, yeah. so we have a set of two place, uh, a set of pairs of entities, so we have D5 is near D2 in this model, and D5 was this dog, which is near D2, the woman, and we have uh, D2 is near D5, of course, if uh, uh, it's a reflexive relation, and we also have the at relation, which is D6 is at D3. D6 is the bird, which is at D3. It's, a, it's one of these houses. Yeah. That's one way to uh, actually make a model explicit. Okay. Uh, with these models, we also need uh, a signature or vocabulary. Because as we've seen here, we use a lot of symbols here. Yeah? These are often called the non-logical symbols. But we sort of need to be uh, sure that we use the same symbols in these models as we use them in the uh, logical language that we use. Yeah. So we need to sort of make a, yeah, a sort of dictionary, a vocabulary, and say how we, what, what symbols we use and how we use them. Yeah. So we say there's a two-place relation love, there's a two-place relation hate, there's a one-place relation man, there's a constant mia, and so on and so on. Yeah. And these vocabularies, these signatures, they tell us the topic of conversation and also the language of conversation, yeah, which symbols we're using. So here's another example model. Uh, so here you see a model with four entities. The one is called Mia, one is called Honeybody, the one is called Vincent and Yolanda. There's two customers, D1 and D3. So Vincent and Mia are customers. There's two robbers, D2 and D4. And uh, this is a love story, it seems. So D4 loves D2, and D3 loves D1. So D4 is Yolanda loves Honeybunny. But you know, uh, only the uh, positive information and all positive information is listed. So everything that is not in this model is implicitly negative, right? So here you have only that uh, D4 loves D2, but because D2 is not in this model uh, is not in the love relation to D4, and the love is not uh, uh, reciprocal. Yeah? So D2 doesn't love D4, according to this model. Yeah? So only the positive information is listed in that model, in a model, and that's important to realize. So here, I uh, changed it a bit. So here, uh, now we've got only one robber, yeah? and this is a very sad kind of situation, because no one loves anyone else. Okay? And here there are three customers. Okay, another example of a example model. You can have very small models, but the smallest, you know, the smallest model you can think of is this one, because the domain always has to be non-empty, right? So we make an assumption that the, mod the domain contains at least one uh, element. You can also have very large models. Yeah? In fact, you can have infinite, infinitely large models, and the domain doesn't need to be finite. Uh, so also that you have to... Uh, realize. Okay, so those are models. We come back to that later. 
first I want to go back to these uh, languages, these logical language, languages. And I'm, I'm in my work I'm using uh, first other logic mostly, and uh, I'll give an uh, example, uh, I will give motivation for that later. But if you look at the first other language, then uh, what you have as ingredients are symbols, yeah, those are the non, uh, you know, the, all the symbols in the vocabulary, the non-logical symbols as they are often called. Uh, you have enough variables, yeah, that means a countably infinite collection. Yeah, so x, y, z. If you want another variable, okay, you can get it, right? So that's important. Then you have the Boolean connectives, negation, conjunction, disjunction, and implication. You've got two quantifiers: the universal quantifier and the existential quantifiers. And there are a lot of punctuation symbols: the brackets, and the comma. Yeah, you need those as well. The Boolean operators were introduced by George Boole. You see a picture of him, one of the very important figures in mathematical logic. So, another thing that's important uh, is the uh, terms of first order logic. Yeah? Uh, what is a term? A term is either a constant or a variable, yeah? nothing else. And in a way, if you want to compare it with your own language, a term in first order logic is a bit like the noun phrase in, you know, in, in Italian or English. Okay? Uh, for example, the constants are often you know, the counterpart of a uh, proper name in, 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 in English or in Italian. The variables you can sort of see as, as pronouns, uh, words like he and she, because they don't have a fixed interpretation. It depends on the context of what the interpretation is, just to give you an idea, a feeling of that, of, of terms in, in logic. Then we've got atomic formulas, and yeah, that's very simple. You have relation symbols, and you've got a couple of terms, then you can make with those an atomic formula. And we also have the equality, a symbol, if you have two terms, then you can also say that one term equals the other term. Then we've got uh, the definition of all well-formed formulas. Yeah? So all the atomic formulas are well-formed formulas. If, uh, if you have phi and psi, if those are well-formed formulas, you can make negation, conjunction, disjunction, or implication. Or if you have a well-formed formula and you also got a variable, you can make an existential statement or a universal statement. And that's it. It's nothing else, right? But this is the definition of, of uh, the syntax of first order logic. Yeah, and there are no surprises later on or something. This is it, right? Uh, if you work with first order logic, then it's uh, important that you keep track of the free and bound variable. Yeah? And uh, so when is a variable free? Well, if it's not bound. Well, yeah, thank you very much, right? So when is it bound? So a variable is bound in the formula phi if it appears in the scope of the quantifier, yeah? Either the existential or the universal, yeah? That's an easy way to explain it. If you come bound to now, you have to be a bit more careful, of course, but this is the idea of a free and bound variable. Then we also have the notion of a closed formula. So formulas that have no free variables are called closed, yeah? And usually, if you do these consistency checking or informativeness checking, we're only interested in these closed formulas. Also, if you translate a sentence, an English or an Italian sentence into first order logic, you get a closed formula, okay? Um, okay, next. So I talked about these uh, brackets and these punctuation symbols, but uh, logicians and also mathematicians, yeah, they're only, uh, they usually are very, very precise in the formulations, yeah, that's, that's the job, but you know, they're also human, so uh, they sometimes they drop punctuation symbols, yeah? so uh, as long as no confusion arises. So sometimes you see the P and Q without the brackets, it's not correct, it's not precise, but it just saves a lot of writing, okay, just to give you a word of warning. Then there are different notations, I don't want to go too deep into that, uh, also because uh, you know, in the old days they didn't have LaTeX, they just had uh, only old typewriters and they had to improvise uh, the use of symbols. Okay, so now we've got this uh, logical language and we've got these models, and you've seen how these models look like, how, how, how can we make them together, right? Um, well, it's done by the satisfaction definition, yeah? So this symbol here, this funny symbol is a, satisfaction, is a satisfy operator. And here, for example, you see that the model M satisfies this formula if and only if those conditions hold. Yeah? That's basically the satisfaction condition. It looks very complicated maybe at first, but it's 
quite straightforward. Uh, so here you see not only the model, but also a little letter G. And G is often used for an assignment function. Yeah? It takes care of the variables. So the G assignment function maps a variable to an entity in the domain. In the domain of M, of course. Yeah? So first I'll show an exa first exa uh, a very simple example. Uh, when there's a negation of a formula, satisfied in the model, well, if it's not the case, that that model satisfies the formula itself. Yeah? When is a conjunction satisfied? Well, if both conjuncts are satisfied. Yeah? Very straightforward. When is a disjunction satisfied? Well, if one is satisfied or the other one is satisfied. Okay. Okay, a bit more complicated is this, the, you know, the atomic formula. When is that satisfied in the model? Well, if the interpretations of all those terms is part of the interpretation function of that model, of that symbol. Yeah? And here we use a little kind of uh, a little trick, so we use another auxiliary function, i, which is either uh, the interpretation function of the model if the term is a constant, or we use the assignment, fun assignment function if it's a variable. Yeah? Right, and so on and so on, the rest, uh, I don't want to spend too much on this. For example, the quantifiers, uh, oh yeah, that's also important. So a quantifier introduce uh, its this existing x phi is true if we can satisfy that phi for an x variant yeah, of the assignment function. What does that mean? Well, you have a, you introduce a new assignment function, but it can only possibly differ with respect to that x. Okay, and you have the same for the universal quantifier. But then you say for all possible x variants, it has to satisfy that formula. Okay, this is the mathematical precise definition. Okay. Okay. What's this? Yeah, this is a summary of a repeat of what we've seen before. Yeah, because now we know exactly what we mean if, you know, being true or false in the model. Yeah, because it's consistent if it's true in no models. Yeah, so the satisfaction definition doesn't hold for any, any model. Uh, it's consistent if it's true in at least one model. And the sentence is, is uh, of, or, in all, you know, or all models. But it's a tautology if it's true in every model. Okay. So, I talked a bit about different logics, and uh, often it's good to sort of get an overview about how the different logical languages relate. So the most known and most simple logic you can think of is propositional logic. You've got a negation, you've got the, uh, the conjunction, implication, and disjunction, the Boolean operators, and right, that's it. Okay, there's no variables. Then you have got a modal logic, which is a little extension of propositional logic. Where you've got two modal operators, the diamond and the box diamond for possibilities and the box for necessities and you can sort of see them as quantifiers right universal and existential quantifiers but very restricted the only quantifier over possible situations and that's why first other logic is in a way an extension of modal logic where you can quantify over quantify over any kind of object yeah? first other logic sometimes called predicate logic or classical logic is an extension of modal logic so it's more expressive than modal logic and then we have got higher order logic, we add even more stuff to the language. We say, okay, we add lambda abstraction uh, and, uh, uh, and application to the language to do even more kind of things. Okay, get back to these later. Okay, so um, we have uh, different ways of, uh, of, of inference. We've got this, we have these two different kinds of uh, inference tasks. Yeah? Um, there are three kind of tools that we can use if we, if we are interested in implementing these to implement these inference tasks. Yeah? Model checking, model building, and fear improving. Uh, model checking we're not really using here, because, but I'm mentioning it anyway because people often confuse it with model building. Okay? So it's important that, to realize that there are, you know, there, there are different things. So first we look at model checking. Model checking is a task of determining whether a given model, yeah, so you already have a model, and you want to check whether that satisfies a formula, okay, or a set of formulas. Yeah. So basically, if you see it as a black box, you could the input is a model and a formula, and the output is either true or false. Yeah. 
that's model checking. Here an example. Yeah, we've got this beautiful model here, four entities, and so on and so on. And the question is, for example, does this model satisfy that formula here? Yeah. Or does that model satisfy that formula here? Yeah. So here, what does it say? There is an X customer X and there is a Y customer of I and love X, Y. So we, s we see here there's a customer, yeah, D1. There's another customer, yeah, D1 or D D3. Uh, does is D D1 in the love relation to D3? Uh, yeah, well, D3, D3 is in a love relation to D1. So model this model satisfied that sentence here. Or this one, the second example, there is, there is an X rubber of X and love X, X. Is there a rubber that loves himself? Well, according to this model, no. And we got rubber D2 and D4, but D4 loves D2, but D4 doesn't love himself, and D2 doesn't love himself either. So this se second example sentence is not true in this model. Yeah? Or to put it a different way, the model does not satisfy that sentence. Model building is a lot harder is the task of checking whether a formula or a set of formulas is satisfiable or put differently checking whether exists a model that satisfies that formula yeah? so here the input is not a model in a formula no, the input is only a formula and the output is a model yeah? if you're lucky okay? that's important to, to realize because sometimes you, know, you can't find a model I'll give an example later on so model building serves to check whether the input is consistent and informative. Okay, why is that? Because if you find a model for a sentence, you know that it is consistent, yeah, at least one model that satisfies that thing. Um, and if you find, uh, why is it informative? Well, if you can find a model for, uh, for that formula, and you can also find a formula for the negation of the formula, then you know it's informative. Okay, come back to that later. Uh, oh, here's an example of a model building. Yeah. So the question here is: build a model that satisfies exists a rubber X and love X X. Yeah. Or, or there's a translation of a rubber loves himself. And the way model builders work, they start okay. Let's start with an uh, empty domain. Or uh, and we say okay, there's a rubber and love. Those are my non-logical symbols. I have to find a domain and have to give assignments to these rubber and love so that it satisfies these things. For example, here. If you say the domain is the entity D8 and the robot is mapped to D8 and the love relation with the pair D8, D8, then I satisfy my sentence and I found a model yeah, for this input, so that sentence is consistent. Okay. Here's another example. Yeah. So I can also have a bigger domain, of course. I can just add things to the domain. I can have two robbers. Yeah. One loves someone else. We don't know who. And D8 is a robber that loves himself. That still satisfies this sentence. Yeah. So often you have more than one model that satisfies the same sentence, of course. Yeah. Sometimes you have an infinite number of possible models that, sen that satisfy a sentence. Not always, but sometimes that's possible. Uh, here's another example. Uh, is this? Oh, here you have Jules eats a big kahuna burger. So there is an X, a big kahuna burger of X, and eats Jules X. So here for the constant, that will be mapped to say D8. And here we say, okay, there's only one entity, D8. D8 is also a big kahuna burger. And we have the uh, two-place relation eats, where D8, 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 uh, D8 eats D8. You say, eh? That's a funny model. Uh, yes, it's a funny model because you probably did not expect that John was a big kahuna burger. Right? But we did not say anything in, about in, our, in our input that John is, you know, is not a big kahuna burger. Yeah. So, you know, the, the formula just says there is an X, big kahuna burger of X, and eats J X. Yeah? And this is a model that satisfies this uh, sentence. So often what you do if you, if you implement this, you need a lot of background knowledge, extra sentences, extra formulas that tells you that human beings are not things that you can eat. Yeah? And we haven't done that here. And then if you give, if you give this example to a model builder, a model builder will just give you back this little model here. So we need to pay attention to that as well. So here's an interesting one. Yeah? Try to build a model that satisfies these statements here. Yeah? There's a person called Butch, and every person 
that is a person that uh, where, uh, the first person is the parent of that person and you say okay if x is a parent of y and y is a parent of z then y x is a parent of z and it's not the case that there is uh, you can be a parent of yourself yeah so if you give that to a model builder yeah and you hit the return button yeah it will start trying to build a model and then uh, after a while it says out of memory why is that because there is no finite model that satisfies this input yeah so uh, this often called logical uh, theory doesn't have a finite model basically this is a translation of everyone has a parent yeah so if you try to if you if you give this to a model builder what does a model builder do he says okay that's nice a new example i'm going to build a model i start with d1 i say okay butch is d1 there's a person that uh, butch is a person uh, so Butch is D1 and says here, oh, for every person there's another person and uh, not, there's a person and uh, X is the parent of, uh, uh, of Y so we say, okay, D1 is the parent of D1 we say, oh no, D1 can't be the parent of D1 because of this so we say, oh, we introduce another person, D2 and D2 says, uh, okay, then D1 is a parent of D2 then we look at D2, D2 is also a person uh, a, a person is a person is a parent of D2, so D2 could be a person of D2. Oh no, it can't be. Okay, D2 could be a person D1. No, it can't be because it says here, if a parent of if D1 is a parent of D2 and D2 is a parent of D1, then it's a parent of itself, and we can't do that because of this. So we start another one, D3, we add D3, and so on and so on. Yeah, we get an infinite uh, model, and uh, the model builders that we use are called finite model builders, so they can only build finite models. So they will never find a model of that. In fact, if you give that to a model builder, it will just go on forever, yeah, until it runs out of memory. So, and that's why I said in the beginning, if you give something to a model builder, yeah, if you're lucky, you get a model back, right? Another reason for not get, getting a model builder a uh, model back is that if it's inconsistent, yeah, you will never find uh, a model, of course. But we also have a third inference task, yeah, B besides model checking and model building, we also have fear improving. Yeah? And fear improving is the task of checking whether a formula, or a set of formulas, is a validity, a theorem, yeah? sometimes called a theorem, or, put differently, checking whether that formula is true in all models, yeah, and that sounds a bit scary, all models, because there are a lot of different models, as you've seen, okay. So the idea is that the input is a formula and the output is a proof. And again, in brackets, if you're lucky. Yeah? So fee improving serves, why is it useful to us? Well, it serves to check whether an input is inconsistent, yeah? because that means it's true in no models, and uninformative, yeah? true in all models. Yeah? How that relate, I will show you in a, in a minute. Um, so the interesting thing about fee improving is that uh, it checks whether a formula is a validity um, but the problem, of, of course, yeah, satisfied by all models, but there are many different models, and it's very hard to do. Uh, but there's a thing called proof theory, and basically, they just, they just look at the syntactic construction of that formula to tell whether a formula is a theorem or not. Yeah? So it's just manipulation of symbols. The models play no role at all. And there are many different uh, methods. And uh, I, don't, I don't have time to really go into deep into one. Then just show you one kind of uh, method called tableau, semantic tableau, to have an idea, give you an understanding how it works. There are other methods like resolution, for example, that are more efficient. But uh, tableau is very nice to show how these uh, proof methods work. Okay, it's a rather called what is called a refutation proof method. So to show that a formula is valid, what you do is you show that any attempt to falsify it, yeah, any attempt will fail. Yeah? So any attempt you try to falsify a formula, you get a contradiction, no possible, possible, possible ways to falsify it. Then, if that's the case, then it must be that the original formula is, is a validity. Yeah? If you can't falsify it, then it has to be a theorem. And how does it work? Very intuitively, for example, you see here the little things T and F, yeah? T stands for true and F stands for false. For example, if you want to falsify a conjunction, there are two ways to do that. 
you can falsify the first conjunct or you can falsify the second conjunct. Yeah? If you want to check whether you can make A and B true, yeah? the only way to do that is to make A true and B true. Yeah? If you want to check whether the negation of A is true, to do that is to make to check whether the A without the negation is false. Yeah? And you can see here, for every symbol, logical symbol in our language, we have a rule, a tableau rule. And you can also see that uh, it's a very nice kind of way because you break down the, the rule and you, uh, you eliminate the symbols. Yeah? So you can sort of see that it terminates. Yeah? This is done for propositional logic. You can sort of probably think if you do this for first order logic, when you have got variables, then the story is a bit different because then you need to keep track of the variables. Yeah, and then it's also a bit harder because sometimes you need to do more work there. It's a bit more complicated. Just to illustrate you how this might work. Okay. Now, um, so let's assume, yeah, just for the sake of, of clear, for simplicity, that we got a, uh, a method for building models and we got a method for proving theorems. Then let's try to put them together. Yeah, why is that? Well, they, they, in a way they are complementary. So for consistency checking, remember that's one of our tasks. What do, we, what do we do for consistency checking? So say we've got a formula F and we want to see if that's consistent. Then we say, okay, we give F to the model builder. If it finds a model, then F is consistent. Okay. At the same time, we give the negation of F to a VM prover. If it finds a proof, then F is inconsistent. Okay. And the same for informativeness checking. This is, is basically the other way around. So for informative, if you want to check if F is informative, uh, we give negation to a model builder. If it finds a model, then we know that F is n informative. And we give F to the VM prover. If it finds a proof, then F is uninformative. And it's true in all models, it's a tautology. Yeah. And uh, the nice thing of these is, is that, uh, show you for example here, uh, if the model builder finds a model, yeah, then the field improver will never find a proof for the negation of that input. Yeah, it's impossible, yeah? theoretically speaking, of course, it could be a bug in the field improver. So, yeah? so that means if the model builder finds the results, yeah, you can say, hey, field improver, what are you doing? You will never find a proof. Stop it. Right? So the way is, the idea is that you put it in parallel. So you use parallel processing, give one problem to the model builder and one problem to the fee improver, the negation of that problem to the fee improver. Yeah? Same for the fee improver. If the fee improver finds a proof of the negation of that thing, yeah, uh, then it's clear that there is no model. Yeah? And then you can tell the model builder, hey, you can, I, I know you're trying to find a model for that formula, but it doesn't have a model, right? Stop it. Right? So there's a way to sort of uh, make the chance that you find the results for finding, for, for finding a consistent or inconsistent uh, uh, result uh, a bit larger, right? To both use a model builder and a fee improver. So in a way, this fee improving and model building, I, I often say they are the yin and yang of, 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 uh, as of inference, yeah? So uh, fee improving is the, 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 the black, the negative, pessimistic kind of thing, yeah? Fee improver, he gets an input, it's oh, okay, you're probably inconsistent. Yeah, and it tries to find a way to show that the input is inconsistent. A model building is the yang of the inference, it's the optimistic, the light kind of thing. Like, oh, a formula, I think you are probably, you have a model, I try to find a model for you. Okay? And they are complementary, and you should use them together if you implement inference. Okay, so this is the general picture, and then yeah, there's good and bad news. Okay, so the good news, uh, oh, we start with the bad news, yeah. So, uh, actually, it's very bad news. Yeah. The bad news is that first, all the logic is, is not decidable. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's no algorithm capable of determining whether an input formula is a theorem or not. Okay, so don't think, oh, you know, I, I probably I will fix this problem, and, you know, next Sunday I have time, I will, I'm, I'm going to implement a fee improvement that is, you know, that's decidable. No. You can't do that. It's not. It's just facts. It's not decidable, right? So uh, that's that's bad news. Yeah. But it's also reasonably good news. Yeah? Uh, first, other logic is not decidable. 
but it's actually a bit, a bit better, it's what is called semi-decidable. Yeah? So if the input is a theorem, then there is a way to show, if you have enough time and enough memory, that, uh, that, it, that actually input is a theorem. Okay? But if it's not a theorem, yeah, then, you know, then you might be unlucky and never, you know, never get the result back. Okay? Uh, but that, that's good, right? Because the theorem prover will find the results yeah, if the thing input is a, is a theorem. Yeah. And the other good news is, uh, that's uh, relatively good news, if, if you want to try to find a fine model, yeah, so you use a model build and say, find a model of size 20 or so, or 100, yeah, that is also decidable. Okay? And you can sort of see why, right? You just try to find a model for a, a restricted, uh, a limited size, and the answer is either yes or no. So in a way, putting these things together, using a fine model builder and uh, a VM prover, together uh, is a system that terminates, right? Uh, so that, that's good in, in terms of practical terms. Of course, you can still have a model that is infinitely large, uh, and your, your model builder will never find that. Yeah? That still has a problem that we can't really deal with. Okay. Uh, we move on now, I think. Maybe there's even a break, I don't know exactly, I remember. But uh, now we sort of know uh, the logical part of it and the inference part is that that's what we want to uh, use, right? Uh, and uh, I sh I've shown you some meaning representations of sentences, right? But, you know, how, how can we really judge? How can we really evaluate whether these are adequate symbols, right? If, if you have a sentence like, uh, yes, a customer loves, uh, you know, someone else, I give you some symbols and, you know, you just assume uh, this is a nice representation, but how, how do we know that these are adequate representations? Yeah? Uh, and the way we do that is, is use these inference tests. Yeah? So if you say here, like, you know, Mia smokes, every woman smokes, a tall woman smokes, if you, if you represent that in logic, how do we know it's a good representation? Well, uh, first, of course, you need a sort of systi systematic way of representing it, and you need to make the right predictions, right? So if you translate me as smokes into logic, and if you translate a woman a woman smoked into logic, you want to predict that me as smokes entails that a woman smokes. Okay? Me as smokes a cigarette at the table, if you translate into that into logic, you want to predict that me as smokes at a table. If you don't get that prediction, you don't have a proper meaning representation. Yeah? And so on and so on. Yeah? But that's the way it works. And uh, I've got a couple of case studies here, and uh, I will show you, I'm just probably going quite quickly, because uh, 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 otherwise it takes too long, but just to give you an idea, right, that in a way it's quite arbitrary, but the problem is if you read the textbook on formal semantics, they don't explain you to this, that you say, okay, this is the way it is, yeah? and often they're right, but, you know, why is it the way it is, you know, and not different? So first of all, you say, okay, Mia smokes and a woman smokes. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I don't care about first or logic. I just use proposition logic. Say, uh, Mia smokes is just P121. Uh, a woman smokes is P247. Yeah? And I still want this entailment. I say, okay, no problem. I have background knowledge. And I say that P121 entails P147. Yeah? That's correct, right? It gives you the right predictions. But it's a bit silly, of course. It doesn't scale up because you need a new proposition of variable for every sentence. Yeah? And you know that human beings can generate just new sentences as they like, so that doesn't really work. Uh, so that's why we use predicate logic, and we can, we can say, okay, here smokes. Yeah? Predicate logic, we need to choose a functor and an argument, right? What do we use as symbols? We say, okay, I use me as a, a functor, for example, and smokes as an argument, a constant. And then I say, a woman, okay, I'll translate a woman into a new symbol, a uh, hyphen woman. And again, I have the constant smoke as an argument. And then I've got background knowledge for all x. If x is Mia, then x is also a woman. Yeah. Uh, again, this is never, you, you won't see this in a textbook. I like that. Because it's, uh, you know, it's a bad choice of the, of the predicate and argument distinction. Yeah. Here, smokes is an intransitive verb. That means it only has one argument. But a lot of verbs that have two arguments or three arguments, like, uh, for example, uh, cooking has two arguments, and, uh, giving has three arguments, 
and then you know it doesn't scale up to those kind of verbs. But this is what you do not normally see. Yeah, you've got something like this. We say, okay, the verb is often the predicate symbol, and the noun phrase is the argument. So this is what you see: smokes Mia, smokes a woman. And again, we need backup normative because we know that we have to say that oh, if X is equal to Mia, then X is also equal to a woman. Of course, that's also not very handy. The noun phrases don't scale. There's a lot of different noun scales and uh, noun, noun phrases in natural language, so it's a bit silly. So what we do we introduce variables. Yeah. So say there is an X as a woman of X and X smokes, and then we have got still we need knowledge that Mia is a woman, but that's fine. Okay, and this is going in a better direction. This is promising. Yeah. Now we have also quantifies every woman smokes. Uh, we say, okay, every woman, yeah, okay, existential quantifier. Uh, but there we say, hey, this doesn't give the right prediction. Yeah, we need another different kind of uh, quantifier, we need a universal quantifier, uh, because it doesn't produce the right entailments. Yeah, so we use a different quantifier and we say, hey, this says actually that for all x, x is a woman, and uh, x smokes. That's also not good. Uh, we get the right inference, but we also say that everything in the, in the world is a woman and smokes, so we need a different symbol there, yeah? so we use the implication, and we get the right inference, and also a proper restriction of the universal quantifier. Yeah? Now these steps are normally taken for granted in, in, in books of formal semantics, this is the way it works. Now here's some other examples, uh, then I want to jump to uh, uh, another American philosopher, Donald uh, Davidson, so he introduced uh, a way to uh, also uh, represent events. Yeah? So for example, if you have uh, Mia smokes, and Mia smokes uh, silently, yeah, what do you do with this silently, right? But it, it sort of it tells you a bit about the smoking event. And he says, okay, noun phrases like Mia or a woman, they can introduce a variable, but so can uh, 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 verbs like smoking. Yeah? So here there's an X. Next is a smoking event, and Mia is the argument of the smoking event, or is in, in a relation to that smoking event, and that smoking event is done in a silent way. Yeah? And from that you can sort of also infer that Mia smokes, this is the representation for smokes, uh, Mia smokes. Yeah? So that's nice because it scales, you can sort of can add new sentences with a lot of adverbs, uh, and there's no background knowledge needed, that's nice, and this is uh, known as the David analysis yeah then we have uh, what is this uh, oh yeah then of course there's a problem that uh, you now smoking can be used as uh, intransitive that you know someone smokes but you can also say that someone smokes a cigarette right and then in the Davidsonian way you say okay there's two kinds of smokes there's a smokes two place and a smokes three place relation and uh, that's nice but you need done background knowledge you need to say that if X smokes Y, uh, Z, then it also is the case of X smokes Y, yeah? And so that's not so nice because you need extra background knowledge, yeah? And because of that, people introduced thematic roles in meaning representation. Basically, all the participants in an event are related to the event by a new kind of relation. Um, and the kind of relations that people use are things like agent, patient, theme, location, experiencer, and so on, and so on. Now, an agent can be the human that is, you know, causing the event. The patient is the participant that undergoes the process. And if you introduce that in the representation, you get something like this. So Mia smokes a cigarette, there's a cigarette, there's a smoking event, and Mia is the agent of that smoking event, and X is the patient of that smoking event. Yeah? And again, that's nice because there's no background knowledge required, uh, uh, but we need, uh, you know, we need a set of, of these roles, right? We have some examples, but the question, of course, is are these enough roles or not? And uh, this is known as the Neo-Davidsonian analysis, right? If you come across that, you know, that's a Neo-Davidsonian analysis. Uh, so this is another example. I just skip through this. Uh, then we have coordination, you know, things like Mia smiles and smokes. From that we want to infer that Mia smiles. And so you think, okay, smiles and smokes, I can make a new symbol for that. But that's not so handy, because you need a lot of background knowledge. You can see that it also doesn't scale up. Yeah. So what you do is you break it down, 
For example, you say here, okay, Mia smiles and smokes, that means there are two events there, there's a smiling event, Mia is the agent of that smiling event, and there's a smoking event, and Mia is the agent of the smoking event as well. Yeah? That's basically how you deal with that. Uh, uh, skip this. Uh, so for other things like comparatives, yeah, there's no way around it, I, I think. You need to have a lot of background knowledge. If you want to say Mia is taller than Vincent, and then you want to predict that uh, Vincent is not taller than Mia, you can have a nice representation for that. But you still need knowledge, for example, that uh, being taller is a, it's a transitive relation. You, know, you can't be taller than yourself, uh, and so on and so on. Right? So often you cannot escape the problem of having the right background knowledge. Okay? Uh, th this is an example of uh, superlatives, the tallest woman, right? So, uh, from me as a tallest woman, of course, you can also infer that me as taller than Yolanda, getting a bit more tricky again, you need more background knowledge to get the right predictions. Okay. Um, so, these are just a couple of examples, and many things that we haven't considered can be modeled or approximated with first of the logic. Uh, for example, uh, we did not talk about modalities or plurals or tens and aspects, uh, but you can actually also uh, simulate those in, in first order logic. But there are many natural language phenomena that cannot be handled by first order logic. Yeah? So uh, examples of these are relational quantifiers like most, few, and many. Uh, cardinal expressions, you know, counting is you know, it's very clumsy in first order logic. Uh, you uh, intersective adjectives, the like example I gave you is small, you know, small, a mouse, a small elephant is not necessarily a small animal. Uh, generics is very hard to do uh, uh, in, uh, in first order logic, yeah, so it's not, uh, it's not uh, always useful to model certain things, okay. Um, also the representation itself, first order logic formulas are not always handy. And people have uh, introduced a variant of that called discourse representation theory, which is basically a different way of doing first order logic, but it's just easier to deal with certain phenomena. And I'll just give you an idea of the of discourse representation theory. It's a formal semantic theory of text. Uh, it predicts a difference in the acceptability of pronouns. Okay. And it doesn't use a formula syntax, but it uses box-like representations. And uh, so the idea is that it, this theory predicts certain possibilities of anaphora, pronouns, like a politician, politician spoke, he lied. Yeah, you can actually use the pronoun he to refer to the politician. But if you say every politician spoke, he lied, you cannot use he to refer to these politicians. Yeah? Or if you say it is not the case that no politician spoke, he lied, that's also not possible in English to use a pronoun. And discourse representation uh, theory predicts that behavior. Yeah? Um, you can also say, well, I think it's different if you say uh, a thing, if you have a politician spoke, he lied, then uh, uh, you can uh, it, if you say, okay, this introduces an existential quantifier, that's a bit strange because the scope of that quantifier extends the first sentence. It also has scope over the second sentence. Yeah? So that's one solution. Or you can say, well, it's referential. Yeah? A politician just introduces a constant and that he is just picking up the constant. That's one other solution. But the last solution doesn't really work. If you look at other, ex other examples with the word a, uh, like a donkey, then you can actually show that noun phrases like a donkey or a politician are not referential yeah? uh, and people show that with what they call what they call donkey sentences yeah? so every farmer who owns a donkey beats it yeah the scope of the word a donkey extends beyond the clause yeah? it's not a relative clause here because we refer with the word it to that donkey yeah in fact this definite uh, sorry this noun phrase appears to be uh, uh, behave as a univer universal quantifier, yeah? So every farmer, for ev you know, that owns a donkey, uh, uh, for every farmer owns donkey, farmer donkey pair, it's the case that that farmer beats that donkey, yeah? 
But it's clear that it's not referential. Yeah? It doesn't refer to a specific donkey. Yeah, and there was a lot of literature on this, and often people said, well, <coughs> I don't really believe in these kind of sentences. They are made up sentences by, you know, philosophers or logicians, and, you know, they don't really appear in, in normal language. But that's not true. Uh, if you can now do that, you couldn't do that, do that 20 years ago, but if you do a Google search, you find these kinds of sentences, okay? You can say, this is what I found with Google uh, a couple of years ago, you probably find more. So every nation that has a nuke uses it. Yeah. It refers to the nuke. Yeah. Every system that receives a packet will inspect it. It refers to the packet. Or other examples. Right? So the donkeys, the donkey examples, they really exist. Okay? And that means we have to deal with that. So summary. So these singular noun phrases uh, and every have different anaphoric possibilities. Yeah? Logically equivalent sentences have different anaphoric possibilities. So that means we can't just use first the logic. We really need to look. We need to look at the representation. Uh, and the scope of an indefinite noun phrase like a donkey that can go beyond the clause that is introduced. Okay. And sometimes an indefinite noun phrase is introduced as an or is interpreted as an existential, and sometimes as a universal quantifier. There's a lot of problems. Yeah. And discourse rep representation theory, I'll just give you an idea what it does, solves this problem by introducing discourse reference. Yeah? And uh, these discourse reference are basically variables. And these variables can either be universally interpreted or existentially interpreted, but it depends on the context in which they appear. Okay? If you look at uh, so the representations that uh, DRT uses are called discourse representation structures or it's a very long word so they use usually say DRS or DRSs plural and this DRS this semantic representation is a semantic representation of text but it does two things at the same time it's uh, it talks about the content the semantic interpretation of the sentences of the text that you already have processed but it talks also about the context it helps interpretation of words, pronouns, and other anaphoric expression in subsequent processing. Yeah? So it really has two different kinds of tasks. Just to give you an idea, as an example, uh, a spokesman lied. So this is the meaning representation of that sentence. And every spokesman's lied, you get a different kind of representation, and it is with these nested structures, right? So like first of the logic, it's a recursive language. You can have these boxes inside boxes. Um, but there's also a lot of things in common, so you still have these Boolean operators. Uh, there is no explicit conjunction, so if you don't see anything, you have to interpret as a conjunction. So this is spokesman of X and lie of E and agent E X. And these are the discourse reference. Yeah? So sometimes they are introduced as existential. For example, here you say there's an X, so there's an E, X is a spokesman, E is a lie event, and E is the agent of X. That's how he interpreted it. And here we have a different thing, we've got the implication. So this can be paraphrased as, if X is a spokesman, then there's a lying event, and E is the agent, or X is the agent of the lying event. Okay? And this also predicts that, for example, uh, here you can sort of continue the sentence with E, referring to the spokesman. Here you cannot do that. And why is that? Because this X is introduced, and here you can make the equality, the pronoun goes on the top level, this X is in the subsequent, in the nested level, and you cannot touch it, you can't look inside the box. If this pronoun tries to refer to the X, it gets a tick, that's impossible, you're not allowed to access this for reference, that's introduced on a lower level. Okay? That's how DRT works. I've got some more examples, but uh, I'm going to skip through those. You see, for example, negation is blocking anaphoric readings because it takes too long. And yeah, the DRS language is just another first of the lo logic, uh, sorry, first of the language. So it has its own syntax. Yeah, I'm not going into detail with that. It's basically very similar to predicate logic, but a bit different. And there's another thing to deal with these pronouns. There's also the idea of subordination. Yeah, for example, uh, now just for the sake of clarity, I give all. DRS is all boxes and name, A, B, C, D, and F. 
and you can say that A subordinates B, yeah, because B is part of A, A subordinates C, because it's a, it's a transitive relation, and so on, 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 yeah? There's one important thing here, so if you have this junction, B does not subordinate C, and C does not subordinate B, then if you have an implication, then E subordinates F, and this sort of an exception to the rule. Now what do we do with this subordination relation? Well, we use that again to explain another concept, the concept of accessibility. So this cross reference X is accessible from another DRS, if it subordinates that DRS, or if it's the same kind of DRS, uh, if it's the same DRS. And this accessibility is used to interpret pronouns. Okay. What's this? Let's do examples. Okay. Uh, so this event semantics summarized in terms of DRSs. So we have, uh, if you don't have events for uh, Butch stole the chopper, it was parked in the garage, you get this kind of uh, representation. If we introduce events, we get a Davidsonian interpretation like this. And if we use the, introduce the thematic roles, if you want to do that, you get a representation like this one here. And if you, uh, there's another way of doing that, it's called the, the Hobbesian. Uh, after Jerry Hobbs, he uses a, yet a different a way of doing that, uh, where you still have, uh, that's what's the difference here, oh yeah, what Hobbs does is says, okay, the maximum number of arguments of a verb is four in English, so what I do is, I always introduce four arguments for the, any kind of verb, and sometimes I use them, and sometimes I don't use them, okay, that's another way of dealing with it, okay. Then in the DRS statement, we also have what I call hybrid conditions. If you have uh, sentences that appear as complement, like Butch believes that he killed Z, yeah, then the argument of the belief, it's not a simple noun phrase, right? Not uh, in semantical terms, not an entity, but a whole proposition, namely that he killed Z. And the way of dealing with that is to say, okay, we say that uh, this proposition is in his own box, you give a name to that box, and it can use that name, that variable, as an argument to the other event. Yeah? This is also called reiteration, technical term. Uh, basically, uh, we introduce an extra argument for every different uh, predicate. Okay, now coming back to the inference. So we got these boxes, but how can we still do the consistency checking and the, uh, and the informativeness checking? Uh, well, we could uh, build a fee improver for, uh, for DRT, for these boxes, uh, but y and you could do that, but it's unlikely you will make a very efficient fee improver. And there are many good fee improvers for uh, first the logic available. What we do is a sort of way in between, we translate the DRSs, we translate the boxes into normal classical logic, the first the logic, and then we use existing fee improvers and model builders. Yeah. And how is it going? Well, quite easy. So there's a standard translation from the DRS to first of logic. And you can use an extension to deal with this model or this hybrid DRS conditions. Now does it work? Well, if you have a normal box, you, it's very simple, you translate the discourse reference into existential quantifiers, and then you translate all the things separately, and you make a big conjunction out of that. Yeah? And uh, an atomic DRS condition it will be the same, same for the inequality statement. If you have a negation of a DRS, we say that the result is negation of the translation of that thing. Uh, same for the disjunction. The only exception is the implication. If you have an implication, you universally quantify over all the discourse reference, okay? And then you translate the, uh, the second DRS here normally using a translation function. So that's the only kind of uh, exception to the rule. Okay, here's the modal operators, how you translate those. This is the modal translation. Basically, you say if you have a box, a necessity, you quantify, universally quantify over possible situations, possible worlds. If you have the diamond, you existentially quantify over those things. If you have the hybrid condition, you say, okay, there's just the relation between the, the current word, uh, world, the current situation, and that X. And then you translate the arguments with respect to X. Okay. Here is an example for you to do in the coffee break, I think, because I want to have a little break now. So I'll be back in, what did it say, 15 minutes?
in 10 minutes that you make it. Ok, 15 minuti di break e poi ricominciamo. Ok, now in this uh, second uh, lecture uh, uh, <coughs> I will talk about how to build meaning, these meaning representations that we discussed in the first lecture, how to build these automatically from text. And uh, so we do that by combining categorical grammar, CCG, with discourse representation theory, DRT. The way we do it, the method that we use, is uh, yet another kind of logic, higher order logic. We're going to work with uh, the lambda calculus. And then in the third part, I show you the implementation of that. It's a system called Boxer that does semantic anal analysis for texts. So first about categorical grammar, or to be more precise, combinatory categorical grammar. This is a, a lexicalized theory of grammar. What does that mean? Well, it means that, that there are a lot of different lexical categories, a, little, rather, a lot of different categories for different kinds of words, but very few grammar rules. Yeah? In fact, there's only a handful of grammar rules, and they're all based on combinatory logic. Uh, it's not just theory sounds very theoretical, but since a couple of years, we can also use this grammar in practice. Okay, there's a large resource of texts annotated with categorical grammar derivations, and there is also a very efficient parses available to work with categorical grammar. Okay, so um, the basic categories that are used in categorical grammar are just four, S, N, P, N, and P, P. S stands for a sentence, and N, P stands for a noun phrase, N for a noun, and P, P for a prepositional phrase. And uh, with these basic categories, you can make complex categories, also called functor categories, by using the slash and another category. Uh, the two kinds of slashes, the forward slash and the backward slash, the forward slash says something uh, that uh, says that the category is looking for an argument on its right, and the backward slash indicates that the argument is on the left of the category. For example, uh, an adjective like n, forward n, is a noun that's looking for, or is an adjective that's looking for a noun on its right hand side to form a new noun. And the verb phrase is an S back and P, at least in English. So something will be a sentence if it finds a noun phrase on its left. Okay? And so on and so on. I'll give you examples as well. So a lexicon or a dictionary, dictionary will look like this. So you've got all words in, in your lexicon and they are paired with categories. Right? For example, boy has the category N. A word like everything has the category NP. A word like the is a function word, so it is associated with NP, forward N. That means it's still looking for an N to become an NP. And a word like H can be both used in a, a, a transitive and intransitive way. So each is ambiguous, it appears with two different kind of categories, as back NP or as back NP, forward NP. And adverbs like quickly have even more complex categories, uh, as you can see here on this slide. Uh, so those are the uh, the lexicon, and and of course here the example here. This is a very small lexicon. Basically, you have to do that for every word in English. You have to assign it a category. But the good news is that the number of grammar rules, or the number of combinatorial rules in categorical grammar, are very few. And in fact, these are almost all the rules that are used. Yeah? So we've got application rules, 
composition rules, cross composition rules, type raising, substitution and cross substitution. Well, some of these rules are hardly ever used. The substitution rules are very rare in English. The other rules like application are used almost 90% of the time in a derivation. Yeah. You see also that every rule has a, is associated with a symbol. So application is the forward application is the greater than sign, backward application is the, is the lesser than sign. The composition has a symbol B, time raising has a symbol T, and so on and so on. Okay, so how do we use these things? Well, here is an example of forward application. Yeah, so we have a little phrase, we've got two words here, the and manager, and we want to see if we can combine these two words. If you look up the in the lexicon, you will see that the is associated with MP forward N, and manager is associated with N, and noun. Then we can use the forward application rule. Yeah? The forward application rule says, hey, I'm looking for an N on my right hand side, and I find an N, then I can sort of cancel the, these both out, and what's the result? Well, the result is just the MP. So I can derive an MP by combining the and manager, and I do that with the use of the forward application rule. Yeah? So I, I write a horizontal line, and I give, I indicate what rule I have used. That's forward application. Backward application is just the other way around. So you look backwards. So I've got here the manager. That's a noun phrase. And we just have seen that. Left is an intransitive verb in English. So I've got an S backward MP. So this left is looking now on its left hand side. Yeah. And it's looking for an MP. And hey, lucky, it is an MP. So I can apply. I can apply the backward application rule, so I'm looking for an NP, and find an NP, so I basically I can cancel these out, and the result is an S, a sentence, and uh, that's exactly what I want, okay, because the manager left is a sentence. Now we've got other rules, like forward composition, it's a bit different, so forward composition, here another example, uh, two, is a infinitival and cell is a transitive verb. I can combine these by the forward composition rule. It says here, two is looking for an S back and P on its right hand side. Yeah. But I don't have an S back and P on my right hand side. I have an S back and P with something else. Yeah. But I cannot I cannot use the forward application rule, but I can use the forward composition rule. And what is the result? Well the result is this thing here, yeah, plus an MP that I'm still looking for on my right hand side. Yeah? So this is what is happening. The blue things cancel each other out, and the red and green things remain. Okay? And this is the forward composition rule. Yeah? And it's indicated with a B. The backward composition rule is similar, but just goes in the other direction again. Yeah? So here, for example, John asks, Curiously, curiously. So here, curiously is looking for a sentence on his left, yeah? But there is not a sentence on his left, no, there is something else, a sentence that is still looking for a sentence on his left, yeah? But I can use the backward composition rule to cancel these out, and the result is S backwards S. Yeah? So that's how I use backward composition. And this is what's happening. So the blue things cancel each other out. Red one is the functor, and the green one is still an argument that is uh, uh, required in the context. Okay, then we also have backward cost composition, getting more complicated, these rules. So these are things for, uh, in English, called did and not. Your did is looking for uh, a, a bare verb phrase kind of thing, and not is just modifying a declarative sentence. So here we have not is looking for an S back and P on his left, yeah, it is there, but I still have to find something on my right hand side, yeah, and that's why it's called cross competition, because of the cross of slashes, and uh, this is the symbol that we use, big B, X, for cross composition, yeah, and the result is this, so the blue one, the blue things cancel each other out, red is the functor, but I still have to find a green uh, thing on my right hand side, yeah. 
So this is, is, a, is a, a summary of all these rules, yeah, in a more in a nice kind of schema. And you can see there are very, yeah, uh, very uh, straightforward kind of rules. Um, forward application, backward application, and B. And the B rule, believe it or not, is named after the birds, the blue birds. I've got a picture there. Uh, that's why it's called the B rule for composition. And then we've got the crossed composition as well. Now there are other kind of rules that are uh, uh, type raising and coordination, and they're a bit different because uh, type raising uh, takes a category and changes changes it changes it in it in a new category. And the coordination is also a bit different because it takes three kind of things and returns one. So I show you how it works. So here is an example sentence: Z hates, but Tim adores Prince. Yeah. Now, if you try to do that, Z, Z, uh, you can try brace with this rule T uh, into uh, from an MP to this S forward S back MP. Now, why is that? Uh, what's the intuition behind that? Well, a noun phrase is fine, but a noun phrase is, you know, it could be an argument of a verb phrase. But you can also see a noun phrase as a sentence that is looking for a sentence if it finds a verb phrase on its right. Okay, and the verb phrase. What is verb phrase? Verb phrase is a sentence that's looking for an NP on its left. Yeah, so I can type phrase the NP to S forward S back NP. Then I can use the composition rule to combine uh, Z with H. Yeah, I can do the same for Tim. I can type phrase Tim and NP to S forward S back NP. I can combine it with doors. Then I can use the conjunction rule, and the conjunction rule says, okay, if you have a conjunction. And on the left and on the right, you've got exactly the same category, then you can derive that category as well. And then the result is an S forward MP, I can combine it with the MP prints, and the result will be a sentence. Okay? This is how type raising and coordination work. Uh, just to illustrate the substitution, uh, substitution is used as a very specific rule, it hardly occurs in, in real, in real text but is used for what linguists call a parasitic gap. So examples are book, a book that I burnt without reading. And the, thing, uh, the idea is that you know, the thing that you're reading was that book, right? And you can do that with this rule, the composition rule. You get this, uh, you use composition. And now you can use the uh, substitution rule. And the, the, you type raise the, the noun phrase here. Uh, you use it for the composition again use forward application and then you get a, as a result a noun okay so here are the other rules summarized in the schema so we've got the, the type raising rule yeah and you probably thought that the t was short for type raising no no the t is short for another bird name it's a thrush in english and uh, so that's what the t stands for uh, we've got a conjunction rule, and we've got the substitution rule, and you probably thought that the S is short for substitution. No, the S is short for another bird, the star, starling, okay? Uh, that's the substitution rule. Yeah? These rules are quite rare, they're not as, uh, but they still belong to uh, combinatory categorical grammar. And these bird names, they come from this guy here, this is Raymond Smillion. A logician, and uh, he introduced these uh, birds in a book called How to Mock a Mockingbird. And uh, that book was dedicated to uh, Haskell Curry, a yeah? uh, very famous uh, uh, logician. And uh, he, uh, he was he apparently he was a bird watcher, and uh, in dedication to him, uh, Smullyan used his bird names to name all these combinatory uh, rules. So that's why Bluebird. Starling and the thrush come from. Okay, that's just a side. Okay, so that's categorical grammar in a nutshell. Yeah, so you, I hope you got us. I'm not expecting you sort of now I'm an expert in categorical grammar, but you sort of get the idea how we make these derivations. Yeah, and uh, these derivations are very important later on to build a semantic representation. I will show you how, how we do that. But uh, apart from that, uh, because our aim is to implement it in a real system. It's also important that there are 
tools that give, the, give these derivations automatically. And there are these tools. There is a parser for category grammar. And uh, the parser that I use, and also probably there are many, not many, there are a couple of uh, parsers for CCG, but this one is very efficient and uh, has open, is an open domain parser. And also is uh, uh, robust, it has wide coverage. This parser works in two steps. First step is super tagging, and second step is parsing itself. Super tagging, what does that mean? Well, basically, it assigns these lexical categories to the words, yeah? And you probably have seen that before, that this is a difficult task, because sometimes the words can be assigned several tasks, uh, several, to uh, sorry, several uh, categories, so you need to pick the right one. And uh, once that is done, the second stage is parsing, which is basically building these CCG, these categorical grammar derivations, using the, s the small set of rules that we have, application, composition, and so on. Okay. Uh, so this uh, C and C parser uh, is 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 a statistical parser. That means uh, that means it is trained on uh, on uh, on a large annotated corpus of derivations and also the, the, the first step, the super tracker, is, is trained on a large uh, corpus and uh, this corpus is called uh, CCG Bank okay and it's a very fast parser I don't know how, expect, how fast you expect to be a parser but it takes about uh, one minute to parse about uh, 2000 sentences or so that's, that's, uh, compared to other parsers that's really fast so that's also very useful. Uh, another thing is if you want to build these semantic representations uh, automatically, uh, then you need to map these words into uh, symbols, right? Sometimes they map to logical symbols, that means quantifiers, conjunction or the disjunction. And sometimes they map to non-logical symbols, okay? the, the things that are in our vocabulary. And it helps if you strip off the inflection of words. Yeah? That means you need to do some morphological analysis. And the, uh, the morphical, morphological analysis that we use is, is done by uh, an analyzer called Morpha. And what it does is strips off the morphology and sometimes a little bit more. So if you have C, for example, as a verb, you get the symbol C. And for seen in the participle, you get also C, so it strips off the N. Or the past tense in English is saw, you still want to have the symbol C. Yeah? But if you have saw as a noun, then you don't want to have C, you want to have saw as a symbol, and so on and so on. So that's what the morphological analyzer does, and you need one like that. Otherwise you need a lot of extra background knowledge. So, a little bit about the CCG bank, you know, this large annotated corpus. Uh, how large is it? Well, almost uh, 50,000 sentences, over a million words. And that's the size that you need to build uh, uh, a parser, you know, a robust parser for a language. Okay? And this is for English, so if you want to build one for Italian or so, you need a corpus that is roughly the same size. Okay, one problem with the current tree bank is that all the texts are newspaper texts, so uh, the, the parser is trained on newspapers, a text that you often see in newspapers. If you give it a text from a different domain, then, you know, you probably have not the same kind of uh, coverage and not the same kind of quality that you get if you give it a nice middle newspaper kind of text. Okay. What is this? Oh, yeah, so this is what we've seen before. I'm repeating it now. Because I said, okay, I'm using first other logic to... Uh, give a uh, representation for the sentence, but now for the, uh, for all to represent uh, words and, and uh, say noun phrases and verb phrases, we use the lambda calculus, but we don't use it for really for inference, we don't use it for consistency checking, now why is that? Well, you know, we could do it, but uh, you know already that first order logic is not decidable, and higher order logic subsumes everything of first order logic. Now that's, you know, the efficiency properties of higher order logic are even, even worse, right? Uh, in fact, I don't, I'm not aware of any kind of efficient free improver for higher order logic. 
but still we use it as a sort of description logic and in the way that I show you on the next slides yeah so I skip this and here I show you okay so we have these texts right we have the CCG derivations and these categorical grammar derivations they give us some syntactic structure right and what I show now is how we can combine category grammar with discourse representation theory and we do that with the use of the lambda calculus and every word gets assigned a partial DRS I remember that the sentence is normally, is normally associated with a complete DRS with a complete representation but the word is of course only part of the sentence so a word gets assigned a partial semantic representation yeah? that means a representation that still has things missing okay? and then each combinatorial rule in categorical grammar gets a semantic interpretation and again we use the lambda calculus to deal with this right? and here the news is good because as you have seen there are not many combinatorial rules and the semantic interpretation is fixed it's not like that sometimes it's this and sometimes it's that no it's always the same so we add a new couple we add a couple of new ingredients to our logical language the lambda operator we use an application symbol okay and the semicolon yeah, so the lambda operator the lambda the signals missing information and yeah, this and the function application is indicated by the add symbol okay sometimes people use brackets I find that confusing so I use an explicit kind of operator the add symbol and then the semicolon is an operator that denotes a merge between two DRS's yeah? remember that the DRS is kind of a set of kind of constraints and we need to uh, we need a technique we need means to make two uh, make one big DRS out of two smaller DRS's and we use the merge operator for that so here's a couple of examples yeah so this is like before the dictionary so I've got the categories N, MP forward N and S backward MP yeah? N is now associated with spokesman but we've also added the lexical semantics or the partial semantics with that word yeah so spokesman is lambda X spokesman of X yeah and the little word like a, uh, uh, is a determiner, so it's an NP is looking for an N on his right, they cast a very complicated semantics. But there's two things are missing. So lambda P and lambda Q. The P is the noun part that is missing, the Q is the verb phrase part. But uh introduces a discourse reference, here is X, and then it applies P to X and then applies Q to X, and it uses the merge symbol to make sure that everything ends up in one big DRS. Yeah? So this is not a funny email address, right? The add symbols. Uh, it's just the representation of application in the lambda calculus. And for light, as back and P, yeah, light, what is it? Light is something that is still looking for an, an, an argument, a noun phrase kind of thing. And if you find this, so there's lambda n. If you find the n, apply it to this thing here. Okay, and then you get uh, a box for a representation for the entire sentence. Yeah? And uh, this is how the lexicon looks like. So this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, syntactic part. Yeah? So we've got these categories, but on the semantic side we also have categories. But to avoid confusion, we call these types, and they're basically uh, two types that we use: e and t. E for entity, and t for truth value. So the entities are basically the discourse reference in our language the true value is basically you know it's a DRS because a discourse representation structure is either satisfied in the model it's true or not satisfied in the model false yeah and uh, this set of all types is then recursively defined in the usable way yeah? so if you have alpha and a beta if those are types then alpha beta is also a type yeah in this case it's a function from type to alpha to types of beta so here we have an extent, extended definition then of the our DRS language including the lambdas and again I'm not going to pay attention to this you can look it up yourself if you don't believe it but it's just important to have this formally defined right so these are all possibles 
all possible ways to uh, construct partial DRSs and there's nothing else. So, so these are the application rules, maybe you remember them. Yeah, forward application on the top, backward application on the bottom. And uh, so here from an X looking for the Y, it finds the Y on its right and it can derive X. Or here on the back, X backward, Y, if it's a Y on its left, then we can derive an X. So what we do now, we add the semantics, yeah, and I say, okay, maybe the semantics of this thing is phi, and the semantics of that thing is psi, and the resulting will be, you apply phi to psi, yeah, for the forward application rule. And for the backend application rule, it's just the other way around. So here, phi is on the right hand side, is the, is the functor, and psi, everything that's left, is its argument. Yeah. And this is the semantics, the interpretation for the application rule. Yeah. And as I said before, this is just fixed. Right? It's not that sometimes that tomorrow is different or you know, next week is a different rule. No, this is, you do it once and for, and for all. And that's very nice of category grammar. Interpretation rules are fixed. The only thing that is not fixed is in the lexicon, right? It's the meaning of the words. So the composition rules, how are they? Well, these are the three, uh, sorry, these are the two composition rules, forward composition and backward composition. So here's a bit more complicated. So say we have these semantics, yeah, so if phi and psi, then the resulting will be lambda x phi applied to psi applied to x. Why is that? Well, remember that this composition, composition rule is sort of postponing the application of an argument. Yeah? You're still looking for an argument that you haven't found. And you can do that in the lambda calculus by, uh, by abstraction over an argument and then applying it to something that needs it. Yeah? So the psi is applied to x, gives the right type, and that is the argument of phi, and you're still looking for an x, so you abstract over x with the lambda operator. Yeah? And for the backwards composition rule, it's exactly the same, but in the other direction. Okay. Then we have a process called beta conversion, yeah? because if you do this, you will end up with a lot of these add symbols, these application symbols, and also lambdas in your, in your representation. But what we want is, of course, a normal semantic representation uh, that is compatible with the first of the logic. Yeah? No lambdas, no applications. And the way we do that is uh, using beta conversion. So if you look at this application, lambda x phi applied to psi, then the functor of that expression is lambda x phi and the argument is psi and the process of replacing every free occurrence of x so I'm, I'm, again x is a variable and like in the first lecture this morning I'm talking about free and bound occurrences of variables every free occurrence of x is replaced by phi uh, in, in phi is replaced by psi and this process is called beta conversion or sometimes called beta reduction or lambda conversion yeah? and I show you by example how that works. Again, I'm not going to go into detail. So here is a derivation for a spokesman light, the same example as we used earlier. So what I'm going to do is I add the semantic representations. So first I uh, uh, create a little bit more space. Up, yeah. So this is the same derivation. And so what I do is I add a representation for a, it's with my dictionary. I add a representation for spokesman, okay. And what I do then, okay, a spokesman is forward application. That means I just uh, apply the function to the argument, right? Now I can do beta conversion, hop. Yeah. I can do another beta conversion, hop. And I can do a merge reduction, hop. This is the representation for a spokesman. Okay, and then I go on. Lied. Oh, that's it. Oh, nothing. Okay, lied. Representation for lied is... Is, uh, is here, again, I look it up in a dictionary. Then I combine S backward MP with MP with backward application. Yeah. So now the functor is that thing, and this is the argument. So you get this. And again, I, I apply beta conversion, up, another beta conversion, up, and another, be another times uh, merge reduction, and up. And you see here, I got a discourse representation structure. Yeah. No lambdas no application, so I can translate it into this into first of the logic and uh, with this uh, and, and do my inference tasks such as consistency checking or informativeness checking yeah, using the fee improver and the model builder. 
And the nice thing of this uh, of this formalism is that every S, yeah, given the way uh, the types and the, and the categories are combined, yeah, because every time you see a category uh, type S, you are sure that the type of the semantics is a T, a truth value. So that means it's always associated with a discourse representation structure. Yeah. So whatever we do, we always end up with something that is interpretable in first order logic if we analyze a sentence. Okay? That's the theory. So what are the semantic types? Oh, that's just an exercise, we're not doing that now. Okay. Um, there's one important thing though. Uh, this beta conversion is nice, but it's also po very powerful and you need to be careful because sometimes, if you're not careful, you can get the wrong result. Okay? And uh, so there's a constraint on that rule. Uh, so you can only apply beta conversion if the set of three variables in the argument is disjoint of the set of bound variables in the functor. Yeah? And so th that's important, right? Because and also now you see why it is useful to talk about these free and bound variables. Right? In the beginning you said, okay, who cares, you know, free and bound variables, you are nice. No, they are, are important. You need uh, you need those to ensure that everything is going uh, correctly. So, and I show you just by an example uh, how it can go wrong. Yeah? And this is the example. It's a made-up example. Yeah? It's very silly, but uh, it, it shows you what can go wrong if you just do it blindly, if you don't keep track of the free and bound variables. So this is a, uh, a, uh, a partial DRS. Yeah? It's a DRS of, uh, yeah, what is it? No, something silly. X, A of X merge with lambda q x hello x and so on and so, and so on and so on oops y x if you look at this carefully now you see that uh, and you beta convert it yeah you uh, first you look at the uh, look, 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 uh, let me look this is the main operator here so this is the functor that's the argument you can derive uh, this drs here yeah then you can do another time beta conversion and you got this one here yeah and then you can do the beta reduction uh, and you get a normal DRS. Now, let a look at this. Yeah? Look, uh, and these, are, these three derivations are supposed to be all uh, equivalent. Okay? Logically equivalent. They should mean the same thing. But now look at it with more uh, 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 attention. Okay? Let look, let's have a look at this oops, yx. Okay? This x is bound by the x introduced here, okay? If you don't see that immediately, yeah, then you can maybe try it at home or this afternoon, but it's really true. That x is bound, that occurrence of x is bound by the x here, yeah? And if you do beta conversions, you don't want to change the bindings, of course. You want to keep the same bindings. But if you look here, then we say that the same x in the same position is bound by a different x, okay? That's not what we want. That's really bad, yeah? Because now it changes the meaning. We don't want that beta conversion changes the meaning. So that's not good. And that's why there is a constraint on beta conversion. Yeah? It says here, basically, uh, if you do beta conversion, first perform alpha conversion on the functor. Now what is alpha conversion? Very simple. It's basically replacing all bound occurrence of a variable in an expression by a new unused variable. Yeah? So basically, you change all the names of all the variables, hopla, and then you do the beta conversion. Okay? And if you do that, you will never capture any three variables in your life again. Okay? So I show you how, to, how it works. So it's the same example. We do beta conversion, but look what we do. First, we rename all the bound variables, only the bound variables, very important, in the functor. Yeah? Then we do the beta conversion. Yeah? And then we do beta conversion again. And here you see uh, that we get the right binding. The x here is still bound by the x that it's supposed to bound by. Yeah? And that's how you do beta conversion. Yeah? That's the only correct way of doing it. You see? That's what we want. Okay. So, uh, that's the, the background. Um, and now if you want to build this uh, in practice, uh, we, build, we need to build a semantic lexicon, right? So we have all the words, say all the English words. We have the, the categories, the syntactic categories, whether it's a noun or a verb, we have that. But we also, we need to assign this lexical uh, 
these partial semantic representations to these words. And, uh, and we need to do that in a systematic way. way okay? And uh, what we do is we associate every syntactic category with a semantic type. And we use the uh, principle of type transparency. Right? What does that mean? Well, it says, you know, if we assign uh, a certain type to a certain category, we always do that for the same type and the same category. Yeah? So we, if we assign, say, to a category N the type ET, then we always do that for N. And we can't change our minds. Say, sometimes we do this and sometimes we do that. Yeah? If you do it systematically and consistency, then you will never end up with a surprise. Okay? And that's, the, that's the, basically the idea behind it. So that's theoretical work, we need to do that, because we need to we have these four basic categories, right? S, M, P, N, and P, P, and we need to find semantic types with those. And it's practical work. And it's a lot of work, because at every next category uh, needs a, uh, a, you know, a semantic uh, a counterpart. And uh, there's a lot of work, because there are about a thousand different categories in the CCG bank. Okay, not words categories. So these are the basic syntactic categories, okay? And uh, these are the basic semantic types. Yeah? So our task is to map these categories to types. Yeah? So S sentence, NP noun phrase, N noun, PP prepositional phrase, E entity, and T truth value. Okay, so let's first look at N. So here, what I do with an N, I say N is an E is of type E to T, a function from entities to true values. Yeah, uh, this is a good idea, uh, not because I thought of it, because everyone does it like this and it works very well. So no way, there's no reason to change that. Yeah. So for example, squirrel, as category N, is of type E to T, that means it's a function from entities to things that are a squirrel. Okay, so that's how the N works. So PP is a very similar prepositional phrase I will also give the type of ET to a people's prepositional phrase. For example, if you have a PP like at a table, it's a function of things to uh, things that are at the table. Yeah, makes sense as well. Okay. Now, the category NP, that's probably a bit surprising because a noun phrase usually is associated with an, ent with an entity yeah, of type E. But that causes trouble because sometimes you have noun phrases that like, like everyone yeah, or some birds or uh, the, the, the teacher, you know, those are difficult to associate with type E, okay? Um, so what we do is we type raise the NP, uh, the type of the NP to something of the ETT, that means a function from properties to true values. That's a, a trick that MentorQ actually did. And uh, for example, an NP like someone has this type here, function from functions to true values, and this will be a, the, le, the, the partial DRS associated with that, okay? And then we have the last category, S, sentence. Uh, not a sentence, you usually think, okay, sentence is either true or false. So what we do is we assign the semantic type T. Well, that's good, that's clever, but I do it in a slightly different way. And why is that? Well, a sentence, uh, if you, okay, if you read the text, right, then you... Uh, you know when the sentence is finished because that normally is a full stop. If you have spoken language, you know, you can, you can start a sentence and, you know, in theory you could never end your sentence, right? Uh, so if you pass a sentence, if you use a machine to build up the structure for a sentence, you never really know when it's finished, right? You can always be longer and longer and longer. And that's also um, building up a semantic representation. You never know is this the last thing or not. It can always be something new attached to that sentence. So what I do here is uh, I associate a sentence with a type of ET to T, that means a function from properties to that sentence. And uh, in that way I can sort of uh, build up very large representation of uh, the, the meaning representation that I like. Yeah? The motivation, the idea behind it is the compositional of the Neo-Davidsonian semantics. Remember, Neo-Davidsonian semantics events with thematic roles. Yeah? And the method is called the continuation method. I'm just giving an idea how it works. So basically, this is the smoke and its semantic representation. It looks very complicated, is it? and it is quite complicated. But this is how it works, right? So here, for example, you have uh, a, uh, a sentence with a modifier. 
Uh, here you have got another modif modifier. If you use continuation, you apply that modifier to the sentence semantics, and when you end up with, yeah, you do function application, you end up with the same kind of type as in the first time without the modifier, just but with the addition of the extra modifier, right? And that way, you ensure that these event semantics are built up in a systematic, in a compositional way. That's how the composition works for large sentences. So here's a summary of mapping the syntax to semantics. So the S is a type semantic type E T D T, MP has the same semantic type, and the MP are of those other types E to T. Okay, now comes the hard work. This was just a theoretical thing. Now we have the uh, the lexicon, and we need to uh, provide uh, partial DRSs for those. And it's uh, you now a lot of work, 500 categories. Uh, some of them are very easy, and but some of them are quite uh, difficult to do. Uh, I did it everything by hand over the last couple of years, uh, and I'm almost finished. And you know how it works is this, right? So you have uh, a verb or a word, promise. Promises of has this category. Yeah, we know that from the uh, from the tree bank, and that's uh, okay. That's fine, right? I take my notebook and I try to find a semantic representation that fits. And sometimes it's a bit of puzzling and seeing how it works. And then I implement it and see if it works. Right. So this is the lexical semantics for promise. Yeah? With the proper thematic roles and all other things. Right? Because if you promise something to someone, uh, that means that you also uh, you need to be sure that the uh, the subject of what you promise is the same as the subject of the promise event. Yeah? If you say, yeah, I promise to come to the party, the guy that's coming to the party is yourself, right? And that's different, for example, for a verb like, uh, uh, um, I need another verb, I told John to come to the, uh, I told John to come to the party, I promised John I mean, we've got another example here. Wait. Um, if you say, I asked John to come to the party, and the guy that is coming to the party is John, right? It's not you. So that's a different kind of uh, semantic representation. So asking would be very similar, but a bit different in the semantic representation than promise. Okay? So this is how the lexicon is built up. And everything is implemented as part of the boxer system. It's called Boxer because it produces boxes. Uh, and you can download this system and try it yourself. It's for English and it's distributed with the CNC tools. And Boxer does a little bit more. It also does uh, ambiguity resolution for some uh, phenomena. And also it has interfaces with uh, first other inference engines. Okay? So we can also uh, use it together with a field improver. At the moment we're using. Uh, Boxer to build a large annotated corpus. It's called uh, the Groningen Meaning Bank. And uh, because we want to improve Boxer, Boxer is now rule based, but uh, we want to make it also uh, to give, give it statistical models, right? To make it more robust and get it to perform also in situations that it hasn't seen before. And this is basically how it works, okay? So you've got a text, what you do first, you segment the text, you see what the sentences are and what the tokens are, we need to know what the sentences are because the parser expects sentences, right, and the parser also expects words separated. Then we do part of speech tagging, that means we look at the words and we say, hey, this is a noun, hey, this is a verb, and so on. Then we do the uh, named entities. For the semantics, we need to know that, for example, uh, that uh, John could be uh, a person, right? And uh, we need to know that Italy could be a location. And then we do the parsing, and we get the syntactic structure or the categorical grammar derivation. Then we need the boxing, we get the semantic representation. And then we perform the inference using a fee improver and a model builder, right? And maybe we can do that. Now one application might be to find uh, contradictions in a newspaper or things that are no new information. Okay. 
to a little bit about the segmentation. Okay, so basically what we do is we want to divide the input text into tokens, and uh, basically there are two different tasks. We have to detect the boundaries of the word tokens and detect the boundaries of the sentence tokens. Um, and that's uh, at least in English and Italian is quite easy. Italian is already a bit harder than uh, in uh, English because in Italian you've got a lot of these clitics, okay, that are attached to verbs. And, you know, you probably want to remove the clitics from the verb. Uh, but, you know, uh, it could be worse, right? If you look uh, in ancient Greek, uh, the people, uh, when they wrote, they did not use spaces, right? So uh, that would be even harder for the computer to find out where the, the word boundaries are. Now, so if you see a little child, uh, he's writing a story, maybe three, four or five year old child, and the way he's writing a story, he doesn't use spaces between the words, right? It's something that you, you, you learn later. For a child, it's completely normal. Right? Uh, and in some languages, like Dutch, you all have compound words, and in, in, uh, in English, for example, if you have a compound noun, you use spaces, spaces between the nouns. But in Dutch, or in German, you don't do that. So in Dutch, you've got these very long words, like uh, hotten, totten, tenten, and downstanding, which you see here, picture of that thing on the, on the, on the right. Uh, this is, that's the, the name for an exhibition of, of tents in the, of the, the Khoi Khoi people. And, and again, you do think, what, what, what do I do with these long words? Maybe I have to segment them, maybe not, right? So different languages share different problems. Then there are some other kind of little kind of problems. You know, what is exactly a sentence? Yeah. Um, not so difficult to uh, do, but you have to think about it. What is this? Okay, and then we do the tagging, assign a label to each word. And this label can be, you know, different kinds of, of classes, for example. We can use it for part of speech, for name identities and so on and so on. And what we do uh, nowadays, we use machine learning for that, so we use uh, supervised learning. We label a large text with the classes that we want, with the gold standard labels, and we learn from that, we learn from examples. Okay? Uh, part of speech tagging. So, to give you an idea, these are the tags that are used for part of speech tagging, at least for English. Yeah? Named entity recognition, and we also need to deal with that. So often you have a, a small set of entities like person, organization, location, date, and uh, it consists of two phases. First you need to detect names, the entities, and then you have to classify them to the correct ones. So here's an example of, of labels that people use, person, location, organization, or other kind of name. And this is called IOB labeling. Yeah, IOB, so I is the uh, Inside O for outside, so if you have an I, that means you're part of the label. And if an O, that means you're not part of any kind of name. And the B is the beginning of a name. Right? So if you have a, a complex name like uh, uh, New York, for example, is two words, two tokens, then New would be a B block, and York would be an I block, an I location. Okay. Uh, this is, I'm skipping this, this is basically, you know, if you want to do this, you need to uh, get human beings normally to uh, annotate this, right? So, pairs, you think pairs, oh, pairs of course, is location, but well, not every time, you know, pairs could also be a name, a person, okay? So you need to uh, annotate this by hand, or if you clever by machine, and then maybe uh, correct it afterwards. Same for the, uh, for uh, part of speech tagging. And then if you want to use learning, you need to uh, select features. Now, what are good features for part of, part of speech tags? Well, depends, of course, on the language. It could be the prefix of the recurrent word. It could be things like, uh, you know, if the word contains a number or uppercase characters, hyphens. And for, uh, for named entity, it might be different. You know? If the word contains a period or a number or uh, maybe it's initial, an acronym, or maybe you find the word in a gazetteer. That could also be possible features for, uh, for named entities, recognizing named entities. So here you sort of see, I'm going a bit quickly now, the, uh, what the features are for a particular example. So if you have well healed, and you want to uh, find the features for that, you look at the context, get the features and the values, and this will be the input for your machine learning training stage, okay, to build a model. 
and you know the different different a lot of different algorithms uh, depends what you want to do to pick the right algorithm and if since uh, so you use the this algorithm to build a model and you can use this model on new unseen data yeah? and the performance on the unseen data will tell us how good that model is this statistical model okay and often it depends on uh, three factors the amount of training data now people uh, will say oh, the more the better and of course it depends on the feature sets and here is you know your creativity plays a big role what kind of features are you using and of course it depends on the method that you're using <coughs> so what's this is this the rabbit or is it is it the bird yeah it's ambiguous and natural language is a lot is often ambiguous uh, so we've got lexical ambiguity yeah a pen can be, you know, mean uh, a thing for uh, a dog or a thing to write. And taking, take is a verb, but even a verb is ambiguous. You know, uh, take take a pill every morning is different from take the first right. Yeah. So there's a lexical ambiguity. Okay. Uh, there's also syntactic ambiguity. So conduct and conduct are different words in English. You pronounce them differently, but they're written the same way. Yeah. Uh, if you look, uh, for example, table, uh, when you think here, five words of table, and they all have different meanings, pardon me, okay? You wouldn't say that. You think maybe table has two different meanings. No, there are five different meanings for table. And it can even get worse. So if you have a word like C, yeah, according to WordNet, electronic dictionary, C, the verb C has 14 different meanings, okay? And why is this important? Well, if you want to do inference, uh, consistency checking, you need to have some background knowledge about C. So it's important that you pick the right C. Otherwise, you might have, you know, maybe find a consistency where there isn't one. Okay. I'm going to skip this. Now, sometimes meanings are connected or sometimes they're disconnected. So bank could be a financial institute or a thing next to the river. Yeah. And nowadays, there are disconnected meanings, but maybe in old times they were maybe connected, maybe the trading, you know, took place at the riverside, and that's why it's called a bank. A fan, you know, that's, you know, and it has two, at least two different meanings, but they're not connected at all. Okay. A tree, uh, you know, we use often tree in, 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 in computer science to describe a certain data structure, and it's of course based on the, the plant, the woody plant kind of thing. Yeah, and these are obviously connected meanings. Yeah. Uh, there's also systematically connected meanings. So if you have uh, Fiat as a company, yeah, you be, but you can also use the same word to refer to the product of that company. Okay, so you refer to a car, yeah. and you can do that for all car, all car companies. You can do the same. Yeah, it's not that you can only do it for Fiat. No, it's a systematically connected meaning. You can do the same for a Ferrari or for Ford. Uh, have the same for, for example, authors. Yeah, you say Stephen King is an author, but you can use the name Stephen King to refer to a book. You, know, you can say I'm reading a Stephen King. Yeah, but you don't really mean the person. No, you mean a book written by that person. And you, you can not only do it for Stephen King, King. You can also do it for uh, J.K. Rowling or for uh, any kind of author. So that's a systematically connected meaning. Yeah. Uh, Synonyms, yeah, sometimes they're different words, but they refer to the same thing, okay? And then there are uh, antonomies, opposite meanings, and that's of course useful to know. And you need to know that long is not short, and if you want to detect an inconsistency in text, then it's quite helpful to know that cold is not the same as hot. Yeah? Basically, they mean the opposite, and so on, and so on, okay? Hyponomy, that's also important for inference tasks. So you need to know that a dog is a pet, for example. It can be a pet, a falcon is a bird, and a bird is an animal, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And these are very similar to uh, things that use a knowledge representation, what they call an is a hierarchy. Yeah. So here you can see that the buzzard is a raptor, and a raptor is a bird, and a bird is an animal. But you can also see that a bird is not a fish, right? Because they, have, they share the same parent note. Okay. From that information, you can infer that you know, a shark is not a duck, for example. Okay. And uh, 
in linguistic terms that makes in that relation is called hyponymy relation and here more if you're on the same level uh, synonymy yeah so a falcon is very similar to a buzzard okay so then we also have the inverse we also have the part whole and again that could be helpful for some knowledge that a leg could be maybe a part of a chair so a chair has several parts and one part is a chair a house has normally a door a car normally has a wheel and so on and so on or the other way around and everything is in a database called WordNet yeah? and that's good because it's very useful to have so uh, WordNet is, uh, is an electronic dictionary but it does more than just listing the words it also lists all these relationships that I just showed you yeah? and there's a WordNet for uh, English and there's also a WordNet for Italian in fact there are three different Italian WordNets uh, okay and the, the nice thing of WordNet it is, is big right it contains almost every English word and that's good right because if you want to make it for a real application and where uh, coverage is important it's, it's nice that you find uh, basically every word in, in WordNet okay <coughs> and words are represented as what they call synonym sets so words that have the same meaning they're put into the same kind of set uh, they're called sin sets now, so here's an example so board the word board has two meanings have two senses in WordNet sense one is that the one here a piece of lumber and uh, it contains boards and plank and other things in different sense is the group of people that it, uh, in our committee or something that is uh, have a certain purpose that it will be part of the sense board and committee yeah this example is since uh, okay and that's all knowledge that we use for uh, checking that so what we want to do of course and we build up a semantic representation and then we want to check if our representations are adequate, whether they're good or not. Yeah? And I can show you a nice representation. Uh, very complicated, maybe, or maybe not. And I can, I can claim, look, this is a very good representation, a very good semantic representation for this text. Yeah? But, you know, someone else might claim the opposite. They say, no, it's not good. This one is better. How can you test whether it's a good representation? Now, one test is the same that we saw this morning are these inference tasks, right? Tasks. You can check if something is consistent or not. And that's what they do in a task called uh, test textual entailment. So you've got a text and a hypothesis. And you see here, Mary bought a bottle of red wine. And then, uh, then the hypothesis is basically someone bought a bottle of wine. Is it true or false? Is it yes or no? Well, that's yes. And if Mary bought a bottle of red wine, then yes, someone bought a bottle of wine. And you get a lot of these questions, just a bit like an exam. So Mary bought a bottle of red wine, uh, someone bought a bottle of dry red wine. Is that true? No. You know, if you buy red wine, maybe you don't have a dry red wine. Yeah? You've got maybe a red wine with bubbles, and it's not a dry red wine. So that would be the correct answer would be no. Or if you have uh, Mary bought a, a, a bottle of red wine, John bought a, a pack of crisps, then the answer would be no as well. Okay. So this is recognizing textual entailment and uh, there's two ways of doing it. There's a two-way classification. So you have the text T and the hypothesis H and T entails H if H contains no new information or the other way is T does not, T does not entail H if it contains new information right? if, it's, uh, if it's not entailed. So that's basically the task. So it's basically uh, you've got two choices. Okay, yes or no. There's also a three-way classification, a bit more complicated. Then you check if it's also contradictory or not, consistent or not. Okay? So they've got three possible answers. So some examples here. Uh, Johan has a beautiful black bicycle. Just until that Johan has a beautiful bicycle, yes. Bologna has a culture capital of Italy. Does that uh, until that Bologna has a capital of Italy? Uh, no, I think the last time I checked, no. So that should be no. Yeah? And these are the examples that you get, right? And, well, you, I mean, it's your system, right? So the idea is you build a system and you say, look, this is a system for textual inference and uh, give me some examples and I will predict whether these examples are entailments or not. Okay? And uh, there are a couple of baseline algorithms. The first algorithm is uh, flipping a coin. 
uh, it's very easy to implement and uh, it also gives a quite a high accuracy, 50% correct. Why is that? Well, because in this data set you get 50% are entailments and the other 50% are not entailments, right? Uh, so uh, you get, uh, whatever you do, you get 50% uh, correct. Of course, you can also always, uh, you can even make it simpler, not flip the coin, always say yes, right? And also get 50% correct. Uh, then there is, and you think, okay, it's easy, right? Uh, but, you know, this is a very hard task. And sometimes people build systems, they spend half a year of building a system, and they, it's even hard to build a baseline then. Yeah? Just to give you an idea how hard this task is. So another idea is lexical overlap. That's also very simple to implement. You just look at the number of words that are shared in the text in a hypothesis. Then you use, uh, you just look at the, the, the training data and you define a threshold. You say, you know, if the threshold of overlap is so and so and so, then I say yes, otherwise I say no. And if you do that, you get an accuracy of 58%, so that's really much better, okay? But you know, there's no meaning, no influence at all, right? Just simple, silly lookup kind of things. So my idea is to use this inference kind of things because all these entailment tasks is really about inference, yeah? So the way it works is very simple, at least if you followed everything so far. We translate the text and the hypothesis into logic, yeah? First of all, logic. Then we check if the text entails the hypothesis, yeah? Or not informative, and we know how to do that, right? With the view improver and the model builder, if it does, if it entails, then we say, okay, not an entailment. Uh, entailment. If, it, and if it doesn't entail, we say, okay, there is uh, new information, so not, uh, so it's informative. Okay? And uh, so I built a system that's called Nutcracker that does exactly this. So it's an uh, entailment engine, so the input is an RTE problem, you know, and the output is a prediction, right? Yes or no. And it includes the CCG pass and also Boxer, and it also includes WordNet, and it has interface to external inference engines, yeah? Because you need, an in, you need a fee improver and you also need a model builder. So this is how it works. You construct the DRS for the text, you construct the DRS for the text and hypothesis. Then you use the translation function that we introduced this morning to translate this box into first other logic, okay? And you do two things. Yeah? You give that thing to the fee improver, and you give that thing to the fee improver. If you find a proof for the first thing, you know it's inconsistent. If you find a proof for the second thing, it's entailed. Yeah? And then, uh, at the same time, you use a model builder. But another thing you do, you add background knowledge. Okay? We use WordNet relations, for example, the hyponyms. Hyponyms. So, uh, so poodle and dog, for example, if poodle and dog appear in the, in the text, and you say, okay, for all x, if x is a poodle, then x is a dog. And use as extra knowledge, okay? Uh, so the feed improves that I use are uh, vampire, uh, mostly. Uh, I've also used uh, Spaas and Otter and Blixen in the past. And the model builders that I use uh, are Mace and Paradox, okay? And uh, why do I choose these? Yeah. Well, because there's a World Cup, uh, fee improving every year. It's not like the football every four years, no, it's every year is a World Cup fee improving. And uh, every year is in the summer, so every year after the summer I look at the World Cup results and see who's best. And then I, I take the best fee improver from that uh, competition and use that in my, uh, in my textile and tournament engine. Yeah. The different categories in the World Cup, and the ones that is important for us is FOF, for, for the logic, for the formulas. You can see Vampire was had the first to the gold ma gold medal there, and uh, so and that was last. Well, that was already was a couple of years ago. But Vampire is still the best. It's basically sort of the uh, you know uh, the best, the fastest, and the co fastest fee improver, but also the one with the highest coverage, as you can see from these results. Okay. Uh, so the result is a system for English. It's based on discourse representation theory and, and fear improving. And again, this is also a system you can download yourself, okay, and try it. It's not easy to uh, install because it has a lot of these different components, but uh, it, it should work. And uh, so you can try it yourself on these simple examples just to see if it's working. I'm going to continue this. But I, I'll tell you a bit about uh, performance. Yeah? 
because the performance is not as good as you probably, well, as at least as I was hoping for. Uh, so here you see different methods for tactile entailment. Flipping a coin, we know that's 50% accuracy, a very high coverage, right? Uh, token overlap is, uh, is a bit higher. If you look at word nets overlap, so you do a little bit more clever with uh, words that are similar, you, you increase in, uh, accuracy, but you lose coverage because sometimes words are not in word net. Um, if you look at, uh, I, I skipped the model overlap, it's a bit more complicated. But if you look at the proof, then you see the accuracy is very good, right? That means if you find a proof, then you normally it is an entailment. <coughs> but the coverage is really, is really low because uh, often you don't find a proof. Right? And that's because often there's background knowledge missing. And the background knowledge is really the hard problem to do this. Okay, we have a little break and then, uh, then I, I have another short, if, there is, if you have time on your side, a short uh, 10 minutes lecture how we, uh, uh, about the future, okay? <coughs> is it okay? <coughs> you can ask questions now, maybe at this part. But, uh, Se avete domande a questo è il momento per poterle fare, per esempio. Qualcuno ha qualcosa da chiedere? Dato che non sono riuscito a seguire bene la prima parte della, della presentazione, sarebbe possibile avere un qualche riferimento a libri o documenti online? Allora, sicuramente eh, le slide sono presenti sul sito laboratorio del basso. Comunque adesso gli chiedo se mh, ha dei libri da consigliare. Comunque eh, lui è autore di molti libri dal punto di vista, soprattutto sulla, sulla semantica formale. Quindi sicuramente i suoi libri sono un ottimo punto di riferimento, però adesso chiedo anche a lui. Question. Okay, that's nice. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, so the question is what books or references can we use to deepen our knowledge in this field? Um, there, uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, there is uh, a book that I uh, co-wrote myself uh, with uh, Patrick Blackburn. It's called uh, Representation and Inference. That book was written in 2005. So uh, it was the only book on computational semantics in that time, but uh, but now it's a bit outdated, of course, but because the, uh, uh, the the area is moving very fast. Yeah? But uh, that book is uh, I would recommend to start uh, reading if you want to know about this consistency and informativeness checking. That would be a good start. There is uh, about the textual entailment. There is. Uh, uh, a shared task with a lot of uh, publications on that. If you just look for uh, the RTE, uh, it's called the RTE uh, shared task, you will find a lot of uh, publications on that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think those are the most important starting points. Okay, adesso pongo pure un'altra domanda. La domanda che voglio porgli io è riguardo a come questi modelli possono um, gestire uh, la vaghezza del linguaggio naturale, visto che sono molto, modelli molto strutturati. Modelli basati sulla rappresentazione formale del, delle, delle frasi e del, del significato delle parole, uh, come possono gestire la vaghezza?
Ah, another question. How can these formal methods cope, the, cope with the ambiguity and vagueness of language? I think that's what is not... Yeah, yeah well, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, vagueness, I don't know. But ambiguity is basically that it is to uh, build uh, large uh, statistical models. Uh, I don't... Uh, it's naive to think that you can just uh, use a computer to spit out all possible interpretations, because even for simple, like, simple sentences you have, you could have, you know, hundreds or thousands or even millions uh, of different interpretations, because they sort of explode altogether, right? So, uh, I think the way of thinking about it is to find a model that gives you the most likely interpretation, given, given the context. Yeah. But these models have to be learned of something, and, and I think uh, a good idea is to build uh, big collections of text with semantic representations to, to learn these models. And uh, actually, that's one thing that we are working on now. I hope this answers your question. Ci sono altre domande oppure facciamo l'ultima parte della presentazione? Va bene, possiamo andare avanti. Oh, okay. We have the... Uh, we go on now. So this does, is the last thing I want to show. It's, uh, it's not very long. What is this? You have these slides here? One, two, three. Those. You have them there? So, can I start? I don't see anything. Yes? Okay. So, uh, This will take uh, 50 minutes, okay, and then I end the lecture because then I'm hungry and I'm going for lunch. But this is something that uh, we, are, we have developed here in Groningen and also uh, we keep on developing. So it's about uh, linguistic games with a purpose, yeah, and it's about uh, building a large semantically annotated corpus. Yeah? And I've just explained why I think building a large semantically annotated corpus is important. And here is a method how to do it, okay? And I have to say this is joint work with a couple of people in my team. Kilian Evang, Noortje Venhuizen and Valeria Basile. And I, we checked he's not related to Pier Paolo, I think. Maybe in the distance. But he's also Italian, as you can tell from his name. So they also work on this project. So, um, if you look Now, if you look around in, uh, in uh, natural language uh, processing, yeah, then there are a lot of annotated corpora available. Okay? Uh, there's the British National Corpus, there, is, uh, there are different kind of uh, tree banks. The tree bank is uh, uh, a collection of syntactic analyses. There are uh, collections, there are uh, efforts that combine different kind of annotations, like uh, on per notes that I show here, uh, and so on and so on. But there is nothing for semantics. There's no meaning representations. There's no corpus that uh, has these logical uh, representations that I showed you before. Okay? And, uh, but, you know, these annotated corpora, 
they have, they have changed the world. Okay? Maybe you haven't noticed it, but it's very true. The last 10 years, a lot of changes were there, right? We now have tools that automatically find named entities and categorize them there, right? That, that works. And that's all, it's not because uh, uh, th th these are not rule-based systems. They are so good and so successful uh, uh, because of these annotated corpora. Yeah? We have Google Translate. Google Translate is uh, maybe not so good, but it's much better than it was uh, any kind of software that we used 10 years ago. And Google Translate is as good as it is because it uses a lot of large parallel corpora. Okay? We use, uh, uh, we have also uh, robust parsers like the CCG parser that I, I uh, mentioned. And it's very good. And because it's good because it's also based on a, an annotated corpus. Yeah? And uh, basically, all, by almost all the work now in, in, in natural language processing is based on these uh, statistical methods. Yeah? And if you want to, to do a, a statistical method, you need a lot of data. Yeah? If you want to do supervised kind of methods, you need annotated data. Yeah? And uh, there are uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work being done on syntactic annotation. Yeah? That means you've got a text or sentences and you annotate the, sent the sentence with the right syntactic structure, okay, by the noun phrases or by the verb phrases and so on. And examples are here in, in the Japan tree bank, there's the Alpino tree bank for Dutch, there's the Lingo red roots, there is uh, Negra for German, there is uh, VIT from uh, Venice, I think, for Italian, uh, so uh, also exists for Italian, and, and many more examples. Okay. And then we have got those for semantic annotations. And examples are here are, oh, there aren't any examples. No, there aren't any examples because they don't exist. Okay? There's very little work or almost no work done on semantic annotation. Yeah, and with semantic annotation, I really mean giving a semantic, a meaning representation for a sentence or even better for a text. Yeah, they don't exist yet. Yeah? But I want to change that. Yeah? I want to build one uh, for semantic representations. And in fact, we started already doing that, and uh, you can find it online. It's called uh, the Meaning Bank, or the, the Groningen Meaning Bank. And what is it? It's a large corpus of uh, public domain texts. Uh, in English, we work with English so far. And these texts are all aligned with semantic representations. Okay? And surprise, surprise, they are the DRS, the discourse representation for the representation that we've seen this morning. Okay? It's a lot of work, right? So we don't do it by hand. We produce them automatically with the techniques that I introduced this morning, and then we correct them by hand. Okay? And this correction by hand is now the thing that I want to talk about. Okay? Um, but before doing that, I want to show what kind of things we have in the meaning bank. Yeah, it's a very ambitious project. It contains a lot of stuff. And also a lot of different layers of annotation. And why is that? Well, if you want to do meaning, if you want to do semantics, you need to do all the things that come before that. Yeah? You need to do uh, part of speech tagging. Yeah? So we also have to annotate the part of speech tags. We need to do the lexical categories. We need to do the named entities. Yeah? You want to know whether it's something as a location or a person has a very different meaning. We have to do the WordNet census. We want to do the thematic roles, the event semantics. Uh, we need the syntactic analysis. Yeah. I showed you this morning to build a semantic representation. We need the syntactic, uh, uh, syntactic derivation first, so we need to do that as well. Then we have the semantics uh, of a sentence. And uh, if we want to go beyond that, we want a, a semantic representation of the whole text, of the whole discourse. Yeah? <coughs> and we use rhetorical relations for that. Okay? And uh, but we don't want to, to do something, you know, uh, just uh, sort of randomly. So what we want to do is, uh, should be based on uh, in some theory kind of thing, right? Uh, so we have a very strong theoretical backbone. We use discourse representation theory, one of the most influential uh, theories of meaning. Uh, we use first other logic as, as model theory, right? So everything, anything that we produce can be translated to first of the logic, okay, and that's important for us, uh, there's nothing that doesn't have an interpretation. 
Uh, we use a neo-Davidsonian event semantics, I've also shown this morning, and a different kind of linguistic phenomena. Okay, scope uh, is one of them, quantification, uh, pronouns, words like he and she. We also look at presuppositions, things that are taken for granted. We use the, look at the thematic roles. We, in, we also annotate the rhetorical relations and other things. Okay. <coughs> so it's very ambitious, almost ridiculously ambitious. Yeah? But a lot of it's done by the tools. Okay. And, uh, and, but we still need to do some human annotation. And the idea is to have an interest kind of development kind of thing. And the way it works is this, right? So we've got the meaning bank, yeah? we annotate it, we retrain our tools, and we annotate with the machines, we retrain our, tu our tools, we produce new meaning representations, okay, on the better tools, we get a new meaning bank, we correct, we annotate, we retrain our tools, we produce a new version of the corpus, yeah? We get new corpus and we annotate again, we correct, and so on and so on. Right? So the idea, or the hope, is that uh, by giving annotations, uh, our systems will learn from that, in a way, okay? produce a better version of the corpus, yeah? and then we can sort of annotate, hopefully less, or more restricted, more fine-grained, more specialistic cases, to get a better corpus. Okay? That's the idea behind it. Okay, but... This human annotation, right, yeah, is quite, you know, heavy, right? And this is how annotation was done about uh, five years ago, right? In the beginning you say, okay, that's nice, interesting, I annotate this. And then after half an hour you say, hmm, it's quite difficult, and uh, what do I do in this case? And then you get tired, you know, and at the end of the day you just drop down from your computer, right? That's what happened uh, five years ago. And that's, of course, not what we want to do. Uh, because we will lose all our PhD students and, uh, and so on. So he said, okay, maybe there's a different way. And a different way is crowdsourcing. And that's the term for it. Basically what it means is we outsource the tasks, the annotation tasks, to a distributed group of people. And this is also something that you could not do, say, uh, 30, 40 years ago. But now you can do it easily because we have an infrastructure, namely the internet. Okay. Uh, for some reason, the people who do this, they like to do it, so the crowd is motivated. Why is that? Well, maybe because of the social contacts that you establish, maybe just to, you know, to kill some time, maybe you're in the metro or in the train or in the bus and you want to do something, or maybe you can you know, earn something with it. Yeah? And I think the best example is the Wikipedia, right, that is just actually uh, generated by, by the crowd. Uh, another example is the uh, Amazon's uh, Mechanical Turk, okay, uh, the name is from that, uh, uh, what they call the, the Mechanical Turk, what, supposed to be machine playing chess, because someone inside the machine actually did all the, the moves, and uh, the Amazon provides the service to do kind of annotation tasks, but you have to pay for them, okay. Another idea is a game with a purpose. Okay, and they exist now. Uh, uh, it's basically, yeah, what you do is you work, but you work by playing uh, a game, okay? And uh, they have been very useful for certain things. Uh, for example, uh, for uh, picture matching, you know, it's a game called, uh, where you have to match, uh, you have to send, give, to, give it a, a description of a picture. If you give the same description to someone else, you get points. Or this game called Duolingo, Duolingo, where you can learn language. Yeah, I hope you translate uh, something. Another example is phrase detectives. Those are all examples of games with a purpose. I thought, okay, that's nice. Uh, let's try to make our own game with a purpose. And we did. And the, this game is called WordRob. Okay, you can find it on www.wordrob.org, developed by us. And uh, it now is operational by almost exactly one year. Yeah, it started on the 12th of September uh, 2012. Okay. Um, so that's uh, World Rub. And how does it look like? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's not a single game. It's a whole series of games. And you can sort of guess that every game 
there's a different kind of annotation. Yeah? But every game shares the same structure and scoring strategy. Okay? So every linguistic phenomenon, every semantic phenomenon that you want to annotate introduces a new game. Every game is, uh, consists of a set of uh, multiple choice questions. And each question is presented by a text, a little fragment of a text, plus a number of choices that you can make. Okay? And these questions yeah, and answers, they are, of course, automatically generated from the corpus, okay? the meaning bank corpus. Yeah? So here you see some icons. So every game has an icon that has pointers, you can senses, you can call twins. There are now six different games currently. So the system is set up in such a way that we can easily add a new game or we can remove a game. Uh, that's all part of the architecture of the World Cup games. So here is uh, a game called Twins. This game is about uh, homographs. Homographs are words that can mean different things, depending whether it's a noun or a verb. This is quite difficult for machines to do, but not for human beings. Okay. Uh, I think I have an example here. What is it? Oh yeah, forces. Yeah. So we put here the text. There's one word in both ways, forces. Forces can be a verb, can also be a noun. Yeah. Machine often gets this wrong. So when you ask here, human being, say whether it's a noun or a verb. Yeah. So you can click on noun and click on verb and then press answer. Yeah. And then you get the next question. Okay. Census. It's a different game. It's about annotating the word net census. Okay. And this is very diff difficult for machines. And actually it's also quite difficult for humans. So here's an example. So again, same idea. You get a little text, one highlighted word. In this case is officials. And then you see here the two possibilities. What does this word mean in this context? Is it a worker who holds or is invested with an office? Or is it someone who administers the rules of a game or sport? Now it's the first one, so you click on the first one and you press answer and you get the next one. Okay. Uh, here's another example, just to show you to give you an idea. This is quite different. This game is called pointers. And here you have to annotate the antecedent of a pronoun. Okay, very difficult for machines, not so difficult for human beings. So here again you've got a simple text. Venezuela's president is urging President Bush to use his second term. So the his is what it's referring to. Well, in this case, I think it's President Bush. So you click on the three possibilities are here, Venezuela, for the machine, the President, or President Bush. So here you click on President Bush, okay? And you click answer and you get the next question. Okay, now, that's good, but how do you get points, right? So you get points, uh, of time. every time you answer, you get a new score, you get your score gets updated, yeah? But the trick, of course, is that the more overlap you have with, uh, the more overlap your answer has with other answers given to the same question, the higher the score, okay? So the more uh, you agree with other players, the higher your score will be. Um, and then there is, of course, there is a score list, high score list, and you can see how well you do compared to other people. And, uh, and uh, the, there is another little problem, of course, if you, uh, Play this for uh, three months, you get a very high score. And if you start as a new new player, it will never. It's very hard to beat uh, your. So what we do is we show the scores for all the games played in the last uh, 50 days. Okay. So that time, that that means that if you're not playing, your score will drop down slowly. Okay. If you're not playing, the player goes up again. That's the idea about about uh, word drop. Okay. Now there's a little twist. Okay, so you can also take risks in answering, and you can bet on the correctness of an answer. Okay, so if you put in an answer and a bet, the higher the bet, the more po the points you can win, or but also the more points you can lose. Okay, and you do that with the draw bar, draw bar here. Yeah, so you can put a low bet or a high bet. So you pick an answer. If you do a high bet, you got it right, you get a lot of points. But if you put a high bat and get it wrong, you get only a little bit of points. Okay? You always get points. Yeah? If you put a high bat, you risk more to lose more points than with a low bat. Yeah? 
And we do that, of course, to get a confidence score of the players. Yeah? So if we see one particular question with a lot of low confidence answers, and we might, we might say, hey, this is probably something weird going on, and we can have a look at that. Yeah? And maybe not use it in the standard, in the gold standard annotation, because people are not sure about it. Because it gives a lot of extra information. Then every player has a, a profile, of course, and uh, uh, apart from the, the high scores, you can also have achievements. You can uh, uh, get achievement, you get an icon for that in your profile. So this person, Kilian, has played uh, uh, a lot of games and he got all these achievements for playing 10 draws, 10 rounds of, of that game, and so on, and so on. Yeah? So why do people play this? I don't know, really, because it's not. Maybe it's you know, not a very exciting game, of course. But people play it uh, because, uh, I think, because they have the idea that they help science, right? Uh, they help linguistic notation. And apart from that, uh, uh, you know, the, the game itself, you, you play it because you can unlock these achievements, you can try to outperform other players, and to be high in, the, high in the score list. You learn something about language. You know, if you play these games, for, say, for English, and you don't know English that well, you see certain words, you think, hey, that's interesting. What kind of word is that? Okay. Um, and you can also win, at least in the past, and we're not doing that anymore, uh, maybe we will do it in the future, you can win Amazon vouchers. Okay, so that's basically uh, the game World Cup. And so far has been doing very well. Uh, so, uh, what are you waiting for? Play World Cup. Okay. So, uh, have a look at it. Maybe you like it, and maybe you can help in making the Kroningen Meaning Bank. That was the end of the presentation. I'm happy to uh, answer a couple of questions, but then I need to go to my next appointment. Thank you. Se ci sono domande, possiamo inviargli le domande via Skype e lui risponde. Allora, ci vediamo alle due e mezza con il talk di Roberto Navigli. Eh, giusto alcune informazioni allora eh, il talk di Ceramita e Salgren saranno in videoconferenza invece tutti gli altri saranno so the, the question is is this game multilingual multi or only in English so we can just yeah in, in principle it's not depending on the language right uh, last month we had a game on Finnish okay but that has you know we uh, that's finished the Finnish was finished and so it's not there anymore. Uh, you can do any language you want. You just have to generate the questions from a corpus, right? It doesn't depend on the language. And the idea is that you generate these questions and the possible answers automatically, and in such a way that you can, uh, be, that the answers can directly be uh, translated into uh, your annotations. And it's not depending on English at all. But to generate, say, if, if you want to make an Italian game, you need to have the tools to generate the proper answers. Okay. So, for example, if you want to do uh, the example on the uh, what was it pronouns, you need a tool that selects potential answers. Right. That is not part of the, the game itself. You need to have a, a natural language processing software that does that. Okay. Okay. It was a pleasure of doing this. And I hope it was useful. Next time I will come in person to Bari. Bye now.
Ok, come vi dicevo, quindi i prossimi eventi in videoconferenza saranno quelli di Ceramita e Salgre. Eh, per quanto riguarda la giornata di venerdì, i seminari si terranno in un'aula del Dipartimento di Lingue. Eh, vi comunicheremo l'aula su Facebook, o sul gruppo di Meshgri, eh, troveremo un motivo.